The Navy continues to search for the descendants of 15 African-American sailors who were kicked out for protesting racist treatment in the 1940s. It's part of a broader push to revisit the cases of service members given other than honorable discharges. Steve Walsh with WHRO has our story. Larry Ponder didn't know his father had been dishonorably discharged from the Navy until he found the documents among his dad's papers. If I hadn't found that discharge, it'll still be swept under the carpet. It would never be brought to light. And then the fact that when we kept pursuing it, that then they finally exonerated them. John Ponder served on the USS Philadelphia in 1940. Lured into the Navy with the promise of a career, he found virtually all black sailors were trained in Norfolk as cooks and stewards and then sent to serve mainly white officers in the fleet. Ponder and his brother were two of 15 sailors who signed a letter published in the Pittsburgh Courier. They warned other African Americans who were considering the Navy that they would end up as seagoing bellhops. Within months, Ponder and the others were discharged as unfit. They was kicked out of the Navy because they wrote a letter. Really what they did, they were whistleblowers. They exposed the Navy for what they did. Larry Ponder is a Vietnam vet. His dad died in 1997. For 20 years, he tried to piece together his father's service. Then he found attorney Elizabeth Kristen. The story of the Philadelphia 15 was not unknown among the military, and they certainly could have been more proactive in addressing it, not waiting for family members to try to find old paperwork, as Larry had to do. There have been recent cases where the military has stepped up to look at historic wrongs. The Pentagon recently pledged to review the thousands of cases of people discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which ran from 1994 to 2005. The Army recently set aside the court's martial of 110 black soldiers convicted after the so-called Houston riots in 1917. But the Pentagon has never issued guidance for upgrading discharges based on racial disparities. Matthew Delmont is a history professor at Dartmouth College. The military has a really complicated history with regards to to race and racial discrimination. Uh, They should acknowledge that racism has long been part of the the military experience for too many black service members and other people of color. Delmont has written extensively about the African-American experience around World War II and has looked at the Philadelphia 15 case. He says there are many families like the Ponders. It's common for African-Americans who served during that era to say very little about their service, especially if they were mistreated. I think this could be a starting point for the Navy and for the military more broadly to acknowledge and and reckon in some way with the, the kind of rampant racism that was practiced in the armed forces during World War II. In the case of the Philadelphia 15, the Navy held a ceremony in June at the Pentagon. The assistant secretary of the Navy offered an apology. Larry Ponder was there. So is his niece, Erica Twila Fay. She's also gay and served in the Navy and the Army under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Anyone we could say at any point in time, you know what, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I was that was wrong, and I'm sorry that we could be better because of that. We could, that gives me a hope that we can be better. The VA estimates roughly 400,000 veterans received some form of other than honorable discharge since World War II. For NPR News, I'm Steve Walsh. Gusty Renegade, the cows, in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Tuesday, excuse me, Wednesday, got off of my days, Wednesday, November 29, 2023. So I have been told we'll be here uh, Thursday for the book club and then here again on Friday for Neutralizing Workplace Racism. Man, oh man, uh, it is not lost on Gus T. Our program for today, we just passed Veterans Day. Not that long ago, I think it's been two weeks maybe, but on the button or so, but two weeks from Veterans Day, so important. Uh, there's such a long uh, record of service uh, of individuals classified as black, male, and female uh, who have served uh, this country and suffered racism while they were serving. Uh, we've done, man, 
lots of programs. Proudly, I guess I can say we have done a number of programs uh, talking about this subject matter. Uh, the Port Chicago Mutiny, I forgot all about that. The Port Chicago Mutiny, that's so important, uh, where you have black, sol- black soldiers who, again, black self-respect. Uh, and we're just looking out for safe working conditions. We're loading all these munitions and such. Can we do this in a safe manner? Can you not make a game out of us loading explosives where we could all die? Uh, we talked about that, and that was some years ago. Really important book, uh, The Port Chicago Mutiny. Certainly, we talked about Black Soldier Blues, and I just referenced that documentary film, uh, Black Soldier Blues, uh, talking about black soldiers doing World War II. They had to grapple and tussle uh, with whites in Australia because they had that whites-only policy at the time. We don't even allow non-white people onto the, what do you say, island, continent, both, country. We don't even allow non-white people here. So they had to do all this grappling, similar to what we're talking about today, grappling to even allow them there. And then are we going to allow black troops to have guns? The Japs are right here close to us in Australia. Are we going to let them have guns? Ugh. Same things we're talking about today, but... All of that is in the documentary Black Soldier Blues. In fact, I was stunned as I began reading the book we're talking about today, a letter to a black male writing his mother the night before he is to be lynched. Even something as (laughs) gripping as that. Oh, yeah, I've read that before. In fact, when we talked about that documentary Apparently, there's a whole book published with lots of the black World War II veterans who were lynched, hanged, however you want to describe it, uh, for cavorting with white women all the way in Australia. Can you imagine if you sign up to go and fight fascists and Nazis in World War II and you go all the way to the other side of the world to be lynched for reckless eyeballing, being lecherous with an Australian white woman? That's the title, but I mean, Black Soldier Blues, double entendre for sure. We talked about that and many, many other cases. Even I remind people, the great Jackie Robinson, World War II veteran who was court-martialed because of being mistreated because of racism. So super important. That's the sort of thing, in my view, if we're going to get a day off and take a holiday to so-called talk, well, hey, Let's talk about the extensive history of racism against black females and males who enlisted. Some gave the ultimate sacrifice. Even Neely Fuller Jr. Hey, Neely Fuller Jr., veteran, two times. Anyway, the book we're discussing today, I had a whole separate audio segment specifically about the Camp Logan mutiny. They just, 110 troops received clemency, deceased. Uh, for the 1917 mutiny uh, down in Texas. But then yesterday, literally just yesterday, November 28, they have this segment talking about black males on the Philadelphia. And it's the exact same story. Thankfully, they weren't killed, so I mean, there's some nuance there, but still, problems because of racism. Same story. And then, lo and behold, they even mention Camp Logan within the report. But, ah, uh, so uh, glad again for Veterans Day. We have a lot of listeners who pay attention to the program who are also uh, black veterans and have talked about their time in the service. So super important to highlight and never can you can run, but you can't hide. The great Joe Lewis. That's a whole nother story. Anyway, our book for today: whew, Mutiny of Rage, the 1917 Camp Logan riots. And Buffalo Soldiers in Houston, uh, Dr. Welsing told us all the time, reading is more important than watching television. Uh, This really important incident uh, in U.S. history, it is mentioned in the televised, kind of dramatized Roots Saga. I think it's in like the second or third installment, episode number four. They do talk about uh, the famed 24th Regiment and what happened down in Texas, but try to read and get more information. Always super important. In addition to the book that we're talking about today, our guest also wrote Legion of the Lost, the true experience of an American in the French Foreign Legion. Really excited to have him on the program talk about this really important aspect of Texas and U.S. history. Joining us live, Mr. Jamie Salazar. Mr. Salazar, you with us? I certainly am. Thank you. 
thanks so much for hanging out with us this Wednesday evening. Uh, for our listeners, this might be their first time hearing about uh, your work, all of your writing. Uh, if you could tell us kind of anything briefly, the work that you do, who you are down in Texas. Sure. I am a practicing attorney here in Houston, Texas. Um, among other things, I spent time in the French Foreign Legion, as you mentioned. Uh, I'm a writer when I'm not busy with my legal work, and uh, I've been in the area for, for roughly 20 years. So uh, there, there certainly was a nexus to the story of the Camp Logan riots. It happened just down the street from where I live, and not a whole lot of people really know about it. And um, as you mentioned, some really interesting things happened very recently. Um, uh, of course, the soldiers were uh, just exonerated, so that was really exciting. And uh, I, I hope that my work and, and the work of the other attorneys and, and researchers uh, helped in that. So I'm, I'm very happy with the results. A little bit late, but hey, right on. At least more people <laughs> know about this because um, I'm in that. Although I do have to retract a little bit. I'll mention the book later, but we did talk about this event some years back, but not in as much detail, but I was not total F. It'd be like a D. I didn't realize the magnitude of the event. What specific type of law do you practice, Mr. Salazar? I practice a few different areas. I am, <laughs> among many things, I, I'm also an engineer, so that background gives me, uh, gives me a segue into patent law, so I do stuff related to patents, uh, a bulk of my uh, other practice areas, including immigration, some family, and uh, obviously you you can't uh, get away from the uh, <laughs> the fly-by-night criminal who comes by and, and seeks some kind of a, uh, services. So I try to mix it up a little bit. Um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, it's uh, it's writing that really kind of gets my my, my blood moving in the morning. So I'm always looking for a new story and I'm always kind of, kind of have a different, a few different irons in the fire of, of what the next book might be. Fascinating. Okay. Okay. I remember that engineering degree at Purdue go Boilermakers. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, man, now this one, whew, so important for folks who've not seen Mr. Salazar. You can go online, you can go get a copy of uh, Mutiny of Rage, or just go do a search to see what our guest looks like for the evening. Several folks, when they were reading your book and all this trying to learn more, said, hmm, I'm not sure. Is this a white guy or no? Are you classified <laughs> as a white man, Mr. Salazar? <laughs> You know, it depends on who's making up these definitions. <laughs> uh, personally, no. My my parents are from Mexico. Uh, I was born and raised in Indiana, of all places. So I, I I've got the interesting uh, interesting fact that I I was one of the few Latinos in the northern states immigrating to the southern states. So I, I kind of did it in reverse. Uh, but uh, my obviously my my name my Christian name is Jaime Salazar, uh, but I go by Jamie because. Uh, most people end up butchering anything closely resembling Spanish, so it's just kind of easier to call myself Hi, uh, Jamie. Uh, and uh, yes, I, uh, I'm, I'm very close to, to my roots. I grew up speaking Spanish. In fact, one of the reasons, uh, one of the main reasons I, I got into immigration law is because I was actually one of the few, which surprised me, I was actually one of the, a very small number of lawyers in the I guess the Houston area who who spoke Spanish, uh, so that that really opened the doors to uh, to practicing immigration law. And um, it wasn't my first choice, but now that I've I've been doing it, uh, I, I do take great satisfaction in uh, the work that I've been doing and and the help that I've, I've offered to to my clients. Fascinating. Let's see. Now, when you started, Mr. Salazar, you said that it depends on who is doing the defining, which, wow, that is certainly important because sometimes there are disputes about who is accepted as a white person. Um, what's what's well, since you talked about your Indiana roots, what's on your official paperwork for racial classification? Hispanic. Hispanic. Is it Hispanic white or Hispanic non-white? That is a really good question. You, you, you know, the, re the reason I, I throw out the word on, on who's defining this is because 
it, it's very easy to get into sort of legalism and, and the minutia of who is who, who is what, who came from what. I, I will say this. I will proudly say that I, 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 I took one of these DNA tests, you know, and uh, you get differing opinions on the accuracy of these tests, but I did it for fun. And, and I was almost half Mesoamerican. So technically speaking, these are the people who immigrated from Asia. They crossed the, the land bridge in Alaska. So am I Asian, in fact? <laughs> the other half obviously, obviously was uh, Iberian and, uh, and other Mediterranean countries. But there, there's no question that uh, I am more Native American than uh, most... <laughs> Well, I should say at least a lot of people who, who advocate for Native American uh, causes and so forth. So I, you, you can definitely say I, I have a confused identity because I've got a little bit of everything in me, but certainly politically speaking and, and in terms of, in terms of what, which boxes I check off, I'm staunchly uh, Hispanic, Latino, Chicano, you name it. For non-white folks who are listening, I have pointed out for a long time, I always reference Lupita Nyong'o. There are other folks as well. Uh, Hispanic is not a racial classification. That's why I said white Hispanic, non-white Hispanic, because you could be a white person born in Mexico or Argentina. We were just talking about Argentina this weekend and be so-called Hispanic. You could be a non-white person. You could be Lupita Nyong'o and be Hispanic. That's why that's are you classified as white? So has there ever been a time where you have been accepted as a white man, Mr. Salazar? Well, it, yes. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting. Um, my, as I mentioned, I have a considerable Mesoamerican uh, ancestry. It, it turns out that I, I got a lot of the <laughs> recessive genes. I, I'm rather fair-skinned. Um, I, I look like I came off the boat of uh, uh, northern Spain, uh, <laughs> southern France. Um, my siblings could be could could could, could play a, a Mexican caricature in, in in a Clint Eastwood film. So it it really kind of depends upon upon uh, the roll of the dice. Um, you do bring up an interesting an interesting uh, complexity. Um, Pele, the the 1970s soccer player, you know, was he Latino? Was he Hispanic? Uh, was he Latin American? Uh, he certainly was uh, of Afro uh, ancestry. But these, when, when it comes to individuals like that, it, it's very difficult. I I, I think. You know, if you if you feel that racial politics in America is, is confusing at times, if you go to if you go to a country like Brazil, I mean, they have something like up to twenty classi racial classifications. So that is extremely complicated. You know, I think I think they actually go by sort of shades of shades of brown, which was which is I, I think to, to most Americans would, would seem a bit strange, uh, but yeah, you can definitely go a lot of you can follow a lot of different. Uh, different uh, rabbit holes in, in terms of in, in terms of those kinds of conversations. Hmm. Metaphor. But, but yeah. Oh, go ahead. But, but yeah, you know, I was going to say, <laughs> circling back, circling back to, to your first question, uh, a lot of people do initially confuse me as as, as, as Caucasian, as um, as a white person, and um, an interesting. An interesting situation, you might say, is that, yes, I have experienced racism, and racism does exist. I'm not a, a, a racial denier. Um, it, it, unfortunately, a lot of the racism I have encountered in my life has, has actually been from other minorities. So that, that, that's something I, I, I wouldn't have expected. But it's, it, it is what it is. Fascinating. Um, I guess to the first or after the rabbit, uh, which frequently the ones that we see on TV are white, um, you said that people do often uh, characterize you as a Caucasian white. Did you mean white? You said because I didn't say Caucasian. White? Do people? You said they often classify you as a white man. Yes. 
Okay. How do you know when this happens that they have they have accepted you? They just think this is a white guy. I'm talking to Mr. Salazar here. How do you know? Yeah, well, it's usually when they crack a joke about Mexicans that I, that I, <laughs> I realize that they probably mistook me for one of uh, one of their own. That's a, that's kind of a giveaway. I see. What? How do you respond? So they make. Oh, do you remember do one of the joke? Man, we talk. Oh, two in a row. Two in a row. We're on fire this week for racist jokes. Man, we study <laughs> racist jokes and have for years. Like, oh, there's whole books on racist jokes. We talk to so many Scott. I mean, like. We get super scholarly. Let's get out the etymology guide and everything and break down every aspect of the joke because they are so important. Do you remember one of these jokes that they told you, Mr. Salazar? Oh, goodness. <laughs> you know, if, if it's a joke and it's mildly entertaining, that, 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 that's, <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of on the lighter side. You know, sometimes it's simply just a, just, you know, a, a, a derogatory phrase or, or a complaint about a certain a certain ethnic group, and then that becomes very awkward very fast. Mm. Do, do you remember one spe- like a joke, or even one of the phrases? Do you remember one specifically? Oh goodness! Well, you know, it's, it, 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 can, it it always kind of comes in. Uh, it, com- it comes in on cat's paws, you know, because they, they might say, "Well, I'm glad that you're not like this group," <laughs> you know. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I am part of that group. So, you know, I, I, yeah, I, that does or doesn't apply, you know. So, so sometimes it, it, it comes in as in, in a, a veil of benevolence. Mm. But, but it is, it, it, there's no question that it's, a, it's an ugly thing. They might say, well, I know you don't do these things, but these people do. And that's, that's equally unacceptable. Fascinating fascinating um hmm. okay so that's sometimes so it's, you said it seems like it's a it's a regular thing where people they think you're a white guy and they just go into their racist jokes uh, about non-white people and what have you uh it become do you do you challenge them do you tell them hey that's not acceptable and in fact i am a non-white person i'm one of those people that you're talking about yes yes it, it, it certainly happens you know Obviously, I, I, I think as, as, as people of color, we always want to, we want to first try to educate these people, uh, people who, who don't, don't see things in, 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 in realistic terms. You say, well, in, in, as a matter of fact, you're wrong about this, or this is based upon a, a preconceived notion, this is based upon just bad information. So as, as a Christian man, I, I do try to... Uh, First, relegate to stupidity that which could be uh, evil. I'll, I'll assume that you're just misinformed before I assume that you are a, a bad person. And that tends to that tends to to get a better result. But I but but I do also believe that there is there, there is pure evil in this world, and it often occupies the, the hearts of, of human beings. So. That's that's when the discernment really comes into play. Hmm. Process that. Make sure we uh, get off to mutiny of rage here and what happened down at Camp Logan. But I and some of even your readers also were. That's important. Do you think that's important? Who who is writing this history? Who's telling this story? If it's a black person, a white person, a non-white person who is not black, do you think that is an important question before we get to what happened in 1917? I, I, I wouldn't use the word important because I think that's a little bit strong. I would say that it gives it a different, that, that, that the person writing it would give it a different color, for, for lack of a better word, pardon the pun. Uh, but it certainly gives the story a different flavor. And I will say that my background as a Latino, obviously, which is neither black nor white, that does color the book in, in, in a certain way, as, as, as a certain flavor to the writing and, it, and, it, and a, a, a different perspective. So, so I think obviously we, I as, as a writer, I'm preserving the truth. However, I am shedding my own uh, essence to the words and, and to the sentences. And, and, and kind of fast forwarding to, to probably the question that you're, uh, you might ask following up is uh, obviously Houston today is about a third Latino Hispanic 
about a third white and, and a third black. Um, but the, the Latinos at this time were, were really just not even part of the equation. During the riots, they were there. And even, even some Latinos were hurt. One, one particular uh, day laborer was killed by the, uh, the, the, uh, the soldiers who were, who were mutinied. Um, but but they, they were really kind of left out of this, this, this entire process. So in, in a way, that, that kind of gave me uh, uh, a, a third uh, person perspective on the, on the events. And it, I, I think that in the end of the day, it gave, me, it, gave it a slightly more balanced um, uh, perspective and, and uh, flavor on the book. Fascinating. I just, uh, I'm reading from the beginning of the book. You got uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Korn to kind of do a preface to the text. And he says, Jamie, Sal- Jamie Salazar is a Mexican American and Indiana native, certainly not a person I expected to have a vested interest in this bit of African American military history. And that's kind of at the beginning of the book, which is why I said this is important. Uh, if a white person had written this book, I would have said that's important. Uh, if a black person had written this book, I, that is important in terms of who is actually holding the pen and putting this narrative together. Always very important. Um, you, well, matter of fact, before we get to that, who is Juanita Lords? Ah. <laughs> uh, you're the first person to ask that. And uh, that's, that's a very good, uh, very good observation. That's actually my dear sister. Well, my, I, I, I say with a bit of sadness, it's my dear late sister who, who passed away uh, three years ago. And I dedicated the book to, uh, to her. Condolences. Right on. Right on. Okay. Ah, thank you. At the beginning of the book, just paying attention. Try to. Um, Absolutely. So you are not classified as a black person, and you didn't even grow up in Texas. Why in the world did you, Mr. Salazar, want to write about the Camp Logan mutiny from 100 years ago? Right. Good question. In the broadest terms, I could easily say that I am vested in the pursuit of justice. I mean, I'm a lawyer. That's, that's what we do, right? It, um, ironically, it, <laughs> I think of the, the maxim, and I, I'm, I'm, I can't recall from where it comes, but a tyrant w- w- was saying that if you want to rule a kingdom, the first thing you do is you kill the lawyers, right? And a lot of people think, oh, that's kind of a lawyer joke. Like, yeah, of course, we, want, <laughs> we don't want any lawyers around. Uh, but what it speaks to is the idea that if you want to impose tyranny upon a society, get rid of the people who enforce justice, and then you've got a clean slate to do what you want. So obviously I'm interested in justice. And to me, this story did not represent justice. This was, this was a, a, a miscarriage of, of justice in, in the way the soldiers were treated. So that immediately sparked my interest. I thought, well, this is something I should write about. Um, but I will also add that the genesis of the idea came from uh, the individual who wrote the forward to my book, which was Professor Jeffrey Korn. He, uh, he's, he, he was a, he's a retired army uh, lieutenant colonel, uh, but he also taught at my law school. So we had been in communication. Uh, extremely great uh, advocate, great professor, and, uh, and a brilliant uh, lawyer. Um, we uh, we kept in contact, and he had been doing work on on the Buffalo Soldiers case. Uh, him and him and a handful of other of other, other uh, legal scholars, professors at the at, at the college were doing uh, the actual legal work, and he kind of ran it by me. I thought, okay, perfect. <laughs> I'm going to be the guy who writes about this, who puts it out there, who puts it, who compiles it, and, and put makes it into a, a, a entertaining, gripping story, a fast-paced account of, of the events there. So that was really the genesis of it. Um, I don't take credit for, for, for coming up with the idea, uh, but they certainly put the, the seed into my head of, of, uh, of this 
the story and the, the fact that this, this needed to be uh, to be written about. And so that, so that, that was really kind of, kind of how it happened. And I, 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 I will say this, that I, I acknowledge already that the, the grunt work, the heavy lifting in terms of the, uh, the, the legal process uh, was, was not done by me. Although I am a lawyer, my focus was on, on the writing aspect of it. And um, the, the actual advocacy and, and the legal portion was done by the folks at, at, at the college. Uh, so in terms of, in terms of the minutia, they have a, they have a, a deeper knowledge of what actually happened. I was the person who put it all together and puts it, puts it into a uh, readable format for, for, you know, the, the, the typical lay person. And of course my background as a writer lended that, lended itself to that pretty, pretty well. I got you. And when you're talking about your audience and saying you wanted to make it entertaining and gripping so that people could know about this, who was your intended audience for this book? Who did, did you intend this to, for like college students? Like you talk so much about the legal work that these scholars are doing. Was this for college students? Was this for everybody? History buffs, people in Texas specifically, who was you, who you think is going to be sitting down with mutiny of rage? The audience is the ideal idealized audience that every author strives for and that is America's living room <laughs> it's, it's the all American family sitting down for dinner and saying hey did you read that book Meet Me a Rage that's who I was shooting for I was shooting for as broad of an audience as I could because as a storyteller I want, I want, to, I want to tell a story to as many people as I can I want, to, I, want, I want as many people to listen to my account and in the best case scenario, take action and do something about this. Hopefully this motivates people. And again, I hope that in a small way, along with the, the actual legal heavy lifting uh, with the folks at the college, I hope in some way that, that my book at least raised awareness and hopefully was able to nudge the ossified wheels of justice in a slight way to turn towards, uh, towards the favor of the, uh, of the uh, convicted soldiers. Right on, right on. For folks who are listening in, there are other books. This is a really popular event for a long time. The NAACP and many other civil rights, civil rights groups, they talked and wrote about this case for a long time. And there even are other books that were published about this case, but they're from like decades ago, so they're not in wide circulation. I don't think there are a lot of easily accessible books that you could read, like layperson, regular person could just go and put a hand on about what happened at Camp Logan and get lots of details. I don't think that is the case unless I've been misinformed. Um, you kind of <clears throat> do a lot of weaving in Nat Turner uh, for folks who don't know led the slave rebellion in Southampton, Virginia uh, during the early part of the 19th century. Why did you make that comparison and kind of bringing in the voice and kind of rebellious spirit of Nat Turner with what happened down at Camp Logan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a, that's a, it's very really good that, that you noted that because he, he, he's one of the kind of the, the motifs in the book. And, I, and I, I think he lent himself pretty well to the story because, we, because we don't really know whether he was a, a, a saint or a sinner. He, Obviously, he did bad things. He did things that most black people would, would disagree with. Now, what we can talk about is, is his motivations uh, for doing these, these things and the impact it had on the uh, racial environment of its time. And, 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 of course, you can't forget the fact that despite his, his, his shortcomings and uh, his, his, grave, his grave sins, he was a rebel. He reached a breaking point and he said enough i'm not going to take this one bit more than i have to and he snapped and that kind of uh paralleled a lot of the thinking and the motivations uh of the buffalo soldiers when they decided that they'd had enough and that they were going to rampage so I, the the addition of nat turner and kind of weaving him into the story that was, without a doubt, that was the creative writing 
portion of my book. And for, for the folks who haven't read my book, it's not, it's by no means a dry academic historical perspective. There, is, there are books out there that do take that approach, and they're, and they're very good. I got a lot of my information from those books. My book brings the human face to it. And as a creative writer, I, I, I wove in different elements. And, of course, Matt Turner was part of that, part of this, this rebel uh, spirit. And the, uh, the, the oeuvre that was floating in the ether at that time and that you could, you might even say was slightly contagious or appealing to the soldiers. And um, it, 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 along with Nat Turner, I talked about some of the other riots, the St. Louis riots, uh, for example, were, uh, were happened very, um, very recent to the, to the uh, Houston riots. Subsequent to the Houston riots, you have the, you have the Tulsa riots, which, which is, were more uh, known in, 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 in in, in, in terms of the history that we're taught. And there's no question that the Tulsa riots were motivated, or at least at least had some nexus to the Houston uh, riots. So it, it's all kind of connected. And as, as, a, as, a, as a creative writer, uh, I, I wanted to sort of tie in what most people would think were disparate unrelated historical events, tie them into a way that, that makes sense, and that, that's cogent, and that gives you a broader perspective of what happened and why it happened. Context of white supremacy. <clears throat> Mr. Salazar, author of Mutiny of Rage. Um, you were just telling us about most black people. Uh, they would probably disagree with the things that Nat Turner did. That's generally my observation as well. Um, are you familiar with John Brown? Yes, yes. And uh, he's, he's also mentioned in my book, uh, another controversial uh, figure, uh, saint or sinner. It's kind of up to the uh, up to interp interpretation. But yes, he was also you... conflicted in, in many, many of, of the same ways. And... Um, he provides some, some context to, to, to not, obviously John Brown was, was not black. He was a, he was a, a white uh, American man. Um, but he was a man of convictions. There's no question about that. And his, his, uh, he has more than just a footnote in history. He's, he's, he has a story that, that should be heard. Do you think that most black people disagree with what John Brown did? I would I would say confidently that most black people are against the taking of lives, uh, it, 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 especially in those circumstances. Um, well, I mean, without opening a, a, another can of worms, uh, you can look at the events that happened in uh, in, in the Middle East. Right, uh, you have two two very passionate sides who are arguing, and in the very least, I think both sides can agree that. The taking of innocent lives is, is almost always wrong, and that's certainly the case with some of these uh, historical abolitionists and, uh, and uh, Mr. Turner as well. I'm pointing that out for Cal's listeners, uh, just as you noted, John Brown being a white man and Nat Turner being a black male. We, Dick Gregory, why am I being putting anonymity on it? The late great Dick Gregory thoroughly rebuked me on this program for suggesting that John Brown and Nat Turner did the same thing. Uh, he <laughs> said that that is not the case at all. And even beyond that, I am remembering the many, many black people who have come on this program and testified that they sang hymns to John Brown when they were in elementary school. I have never heard anyone in any part of the universe say that they sang a hymn to Nat Turner. In many spaces, his name is not mentioned, even in whispers. And I t what I told Dick Gregory, I said, didn't they do the same thing? He said, absolutely not. They did not do the same thing. Like, I don't know. Have you ever heard them sing hymns to Nat Turner? <laughs> oh, goodness, no. 
<laughs> yeah, not 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 at all. In, in, in fact, I you know just just the, the point of interest. I my my daughter is 17 years old. And she goes to very good, uh, very a thorough high school, and she barely knows about John. Bur- I'm sorry, ba- barely knows about uh, Nat Turner. Uh, so and Nat Turner d- doesn't have a as, as prominent a role in American history as as I think he should. Um, and I think it's because he, he's a difficult uh, he's a difficult subject. He's a difficult person, and if a historical figure is difficult, then, you know it's best to just kind of uh, keep mum about it. There's so much material uh, available on that, Turner. If the reason I think the mum about it is the same reason that people don't know about Camp Logan, because lots of people they sing hymns to John Brown. Lots of people know about John Brown. They even have him in current pop culture films, and he's mentioned on a pretty regular basis. It can't be the violence, because we're very comfortable talking about violence. It's black people engaged in counter-violence. That's the pattern that I've seen consistently. Even, where did I read Camp Logan before? That was in the book, That Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, where they talked about the long and suppressed history of black counterviolence. And I think white people in the system of racism have had a long and deliberate and vested interest in, shh, you are definitely not going to talk about this uh, and just seeing that on why this doesn't get Camp Logan doesn't get talked about why Deacons of Defense don't get talked about Robert F. Williams doesn't get talked about even uh, long, even pause for that I'm submitting that all of this happens deliberately because we're in a global system of racism white supremacy you mentioned Brazil before we've talked about Brazil so much this year and even down there with all of the racial classification confusion white is still on top and in charge because my definition for racism and white supremacy is and you're a lawyer so you'll appreciate definitions a global system of people who they classify as not white, excuse me, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white do you think that's an accurate definition of racism do you think such a system exists <laughs> that's a very good question how organized is it i i, I can't really say um I, I i do agree with with some of the uh the the framing that you've made about the, about the, the powers that be and the vested interests uh that are working against uh, the, the black or, or dark-skinned communities around the world. Uh, Brazil, um, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it has, a, has, a, has a history as bad, perhaps a uh, racial history, that is, as bad or even worse uh, than the United States. Uh, I mean, you could argue that the, uh, the slavery down there was, was, was more vicious than, than, than what, was, what existed in, in the antebellum South. Uh, there certainly are folks down there that, 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 that have... Uh, righteous grievances against uh, against the history. So, uh, yeah, there's no question about it in that respect. Any aspect, since you're a lawyer, any aspect of that definition for white supremacy, racism, inaccurate, not true? Your, your definition of white, uh, of white supremacy, that would certainly fit into that. I, I think historically, uh, history kind of proves that it, it, it's... Uh, you're not, you're not far off. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'll share you. This is pretty early on in the book. You talk about the 24th Regiment, which I said is mentioned in Roots. Uh, not that I'm saying you need to watch TV, reading more important than watching television, but just, you know, for background. It is brought up in Roots, the infamous 24th uh, Colored Regiment, the Buffalo Soldiers, so-called. Uh, and before they got to Texas, you include the... 
I don't know, many aspects of white supremacy racism that they had to endure uh, throughout the known universe before they even got to Texas. Uh, this is at the beginning of the book, the chapter Buffalo Soldiers. You write, to prepare for the invasion of Cuba, Buffalo Soldiers were posted to the southeast United States for the first time in their history. They were initially billeted near Tampa, Florida, where overt racial discrimination was commonplace. Nevertheless, the worst racist act was committed not by locals, but by northern whites in uniform. Troops from Ohio National Guard entertained themselves by coaxing a two-year-old black child into the open to serve as a firing practice target. Shots were fired. The child's mother was in hysterics, but powerless to intervene. The youngster was injured but not killed in a response that would be repeated incensed Buffalo soldiers rampaged through the city though nobody died. That's another one I'm sure is not thought of as revered Tampa history and wow we need to have a statue to commemorate this act of like nah, nah, nah. <laughs> either. I think that was so important because that's not what I was expecting at all but that kind of gives a good <sighs> illustration for white supremacy racism early 20th century for black soldiers uh, more that you'd like to add more context you could add for that portion Mr. Salazar yeah I I, I, I put that in there because this was really kind of a foreshadowing of, of things to come I mean you could argue that in a strange way you could argue that that might have been a more serious trigger for a rage, no pun intended, uh, than, than the events in Houston. I mean, you had a young young boy who was being, a young child that was being used as target practice. I mean, that, that's absolutely ludicrous. I mean, that, 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 that's almost as bad as, as, as some of the, uh, the 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 more extreme stories of, of what 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 was done to young, black infants in, in the South. Um, and of course, you might even argue that the black troops in Atlanta showed restraint. I, I, I would have been. <laughs> I don't think I would have. I, I would have behaved uh, less angrily if if I was part of a unit that that did that to uh, to a child when I was present. Uh, nevertheless, the army should have taken note of, of this event and predicted well this this sort of thing. And this type of mentality probably ex- it exists in Houston, and th- this could this could occur again. And it doesn't look like they they really made uh, took heed of, of the warning and made any uh, significant changes to prevent that. Mm. Northern whites global system. Another one where I point out where you can't. Uh, just pretend that this is uh, white people in the South uh, who are carrying out these uh, sort of acts. Uh, you, uh, in the book, and I mentioned that your earlier book, published in 2005, Legion of the Lost, The True Experience of an American in the French Foreign Legion, uh, you repeatedly kind of compare the Buffalo Soldiers, black troops, uh, this actually leaked 19th century, early 20th century, comparing their treatment to folks who enlisted in the French Foreign Legion. Uh, why did that born? And you yourself enlisted a part of the French Foreign Legion, wrote about your experience. Why did you draw that parallel between the two? Right. That, that's a good question. And most people, and it's especially the uh, the introduction uh, before I, I, I came on, the, uh, on your show, it talked about how the black volunteers, the, the black servicemen in America were given undesirable jobs, you know, basically they were clerks or, or cooks. They weren't given the more uh, prestigious positions of uh, earning battle medals or, or being part of the, uh, the sharp end of any, any, any type of, of engagement. They were given what other soldiers, other servicemen did not want to do. So you had the culture of a throwaway army. You had men that were deemed expendable. They just weren't important. The, 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 the superiors kind of took the attitude that you're doing them a favor by allowing them to serve in this this army, and, and that's essentially what the, the, the French Foreign Legion uh, was was founded upon: the idea of taking broken men, 
men without countries, men without uh, men who needed to to escape from their past, uh, or men who had basically nothing to lose, or men who nobody else wanted. They could find a refuge in this army, but at the same time, there's a very good chance they're going to die as a result of of this, and nobody would mourn them. There would be no parades, no family members to mourn them, uh, no uh, uh, no recognition from the country that they that they swore to serve under. And this causes problems. It caused problems in the foreign region. In fact, the, uh, <laughs> one of the lines I used in the book it was the idea that when you don't treat your men right, and I use that in the military context, don't be surprised when they burned down their master's house. And again, as you probably know, that, that was kind of a, 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 a euphemism from the, from the deep south of angry slaves. They, they take their revenge by, by burning their master's house. Uh, that's, what, that's, that's what you get when you, uh, when you exercise uh, abusive practices on your subordinates. And I thought that was a very close analogy to how the Buffalo soldiers were treated. They were they were essentially the the, the throwaway troops of the U.S. Army. They were they were they were sent off to fight the Native Americans. And and I I, I say without hesitation that the Native Americans were very very fierce warriors. Uh, I mean to be captured by the Native Americans was uh, was was nightmare inducing. So these were some of the most vicious. Um, it, military expeditions in, 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 in the North American continent, and Buffalo soldiers bore the brunt of that. They, they delivered mail. Uh, they were essentially kept out of the eyesight of the American public, and they were expected to do their work and not, not make a fuss about it. And the, the, the military leaders should have known that eventually that will cause problems. And you, they can only... They can only get away with so much before, uh, before there is a break point, and that's exactly what we saw. Recurrent theme, Port Chicago mutiny, over and over and over again. Uh, in fact, even uh, when you're making this comparison with the uh, French Foreign Legion, uh, this is in the same chapter, Buffalo Soldiers, you write, in 1831, whew, I think that's the same year as Nat Turner's Rebellion, a continent away and under very different political circumstances. By royal decree, King Louis Philip II of France came up with a new way to handle all politically and ethnically undesirable, <clears throat> undesirable men roaming Paris streets. When I read that, and I'm thinking, like, dang, like, France is, like, extraordinary uh, colonizer system of white supremacy racism the Haitian revolution is mentioned in this text so am I understanding this correct that racism white supremacy would be a part of the foreign legion like the undesirable elements that are not wanted roaming the streets of France are dark people that's a part of this too <laughs> yes yes I, I, ironically that, that would that would certainly be a close uh, comparison uh the commanders of the Foreign Legion used this throwaway army. Bear in mind, this, this was an army based in North Africa. They, they were not allowed to serve in Europe. <laughs> it's kind of like it's kind of like the white powers to be did not want this, these scumbags or these, mm-hmm. these undesirables to 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 tarnish uh, the continent of Europe. So they would relegate them to to the uh, the black continent of Africa. You know the uh, the dark land uh, south of the uh, Mediterranean. So, th- so the, uh, the foreign nation was, was re- basically the, uh, the rifle's end of, of European colonialism. And, and of course, they were the, the, the police dog of France, uh, of uh, Afrique Francophone, which is uh, French-speaking Africa. Um, and they have a dubious reputation. I mean, if the foreign legion is in is in a country that's not France, it's not always a good situation, right? But that's kind of how it, how it was, um, and, and of course, you know, that this isn't isn't a smear on the individual men who are in the foreign legion, but it's more about more talks more to the mentality of the 
uh, the French overlords at that time. Mm. Maximum white supremacy racism. That's why they speak French in Haiti and the Congo, numerous other places, even Vietnam conflict. That's fr- global white supremacy racism. Uh, you write, this is uh, the white magnolia. I've learned so much reading this book. I didn't know they had, I was thinking that's Mississippi, but no, that's parts of Texas. They call the white magnolia for the flowers. Learning. Uh, you write specifically, you already mentioned the non-role, I guess I'll say, for so-called uh, Hispanics, non-white in this conflict. They're there, but they're not really part of all this, even though you do have the one casualty that you mentioned. Uh, you write specifically Mex- Mexicans fleeing the Mexican Revolution flocked to Houston after 1910 and remained a strong social and cultural influence in the city henceforth. Although anti-Hispanic prejudice was qualitatively different from the black sort, Latinos were arguably more economically and politically disadvantaged than blacks. Like, I have to stop with that sentence right there. What do you mean the first portion of this when you say that the anti-Hispanic prejudice was qualitatively different from the black sort? Yeah, that, that, that also is a good question. And I think I, I would answer that by saying that the Hispanics were disliked for somewhat different reasons than, than the blacks were. And I think that's qualitatively so. They they are simply different people. They have a different uh, experience. They come from a different country. And, of course, that they, they were never slaves in, in the U.S. Uh, to speak of. Obviously, you can, um, you can, you can mention the, uh, enslavement that the, the enslavement by the Spanish, but that, that's, that's uh, further back in, in history. Uh, so, so I, I, I think the feelings towards the Hispanics were, were qualitatively different. Uh, of course, they were equally unacceptable. Um, and so their experience as a result was, was somewhat different. Um, I think to my, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit further with, with an example. My dear grandmother you lived in America for 30, 40 years. And uh, she never spoke a lick of English. <laughs> and she struggled. Her experience was, was, was very different. And she experienced unique difficulties because she never learned the language. She never assimilated into the wider uh, white culture. So the language barrier alone uh, put, put Hispanics in a different disadvantage than uh, the black Americans who, who did speak the English language. They, they spoke the vernacular of, of, their, of their communities. Um, and therefore, their, their experience was, was somewhat different. Um, another example that, that kind of paints the, the, the differences is African Americans, even today, are largely Protestant, whether that's whether that's 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 by accident or by design, uh, they largely took the, uh, the faith of of their of their overlords, their their slave masters. Uh, whereas the Latinos, they they practiced the the faith of Rome, um, which 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 was which was alien in in, in a white waspy white Anglo-Saxon Protestant country. That added a layer of, of, of discrimination. You know, they, they were, uh, in, there are scholars who, who proclaim that, that anti-Catholicism is the, the only acceptable form of discrimination. And there's no question that the Hispanics um, experienced a lot of that. You can, this is the same paragraph. I just stopped for that sentence to get you to add some detail for us much obliged you continue magnolia park seven miles downstream from the city center near the houston ship canal became one of the first hispanic neighborhoods in the city the construction of the channel and associated industries attracted mostly migrants from mexico before the petrochemical sector was established established in mass hispanic women commonly worked indoors in home kitchen eateries or shops while the men toiled in construction, cotton processing, and cattle rearing. Uh, you talk about with the population of 
black people uh, in the Houston area at there, or I guess specifically so how does all of this factor into are black people in a better position than the so-called Hispanic people, non-white at this time? That, that, that's arguable. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> uh, that's key. That, that's something I'm not exactly sure of. What I can say is that, is that the experiences were different. I don't know. I, I don't know with any particularity which one was worse. I will say that. I, I think in that sense we, we can agree we're not sure which was worse. Uh, it certainly was no picnic for, for either group. White people in charge, for sure. Um, you taught, and I think this is important for so many reasons because we've heard this pattern uh, consistently. This is all throughout James Lewis. <laughs> Mentioned in this book, we were just talking about El Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm Minister, Malcolm X. He talks about this explicit. In fact, he said he was doing this. He was involved in this before it was El Haj Malik Shabazz. It was Detroit Red. What was Detroit Red doing? Vice, gambling, red light district up in Boston, though. But he said he was doing all this currying for white people who wanted to oh yes go out and hang out with the negras and do some x reading and all this yeah 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 okay i'll be a courier he wrote about all that extensively before his transition we hear the same pattern down in texas you write different administrations with varied philosophies about law enforcement coupled with opposing economic policies created racial discontent the red light district also known as the reservation i mean even that come on (laughs) they call the red light (laughs) district the reservation okay was a 10 block portion of the fourth ward also known as freedman's town that's another one abutting the san felipe district it was composed of all races and ethnicities with the sex workers mingling freely with their black neighbors in the abutting districts however When the more priggish approach to law enforcement came into effect, it disrupted what was an orderly regulation of the reservation. Oh, so important. Though all creeds lived among each other, their different economic backgrounds allowed white prostitutes to continue to ply their trade in more favorable parts of the city. Black sex workers were forced out of the brothels and onto the streets where they were easy pickings for overly zealous police, not surprisingly, the vast majority of Johns and consumers of bootleg alcohol were whites. I just want to read that last sentence again from Minister Malcolm with emphasis on that first two words, not surprisingly, the vast majority of Johns and consumers of bootleg alcohol were whites so important for context and I point this out all the time because white people they will say they want to be separate and all of that all of that is a lie they want to practice racism white supremacy and then come hang out on the reservation literally (laughs) why did you include this in the book because I think this is so important Mr. Salazar I, I, I'm glad that you, you point that out because yes, it, it, it's a contradiction. It, it's an absolute contradiction. There, there's no. There, <laughs> it, it, it's a bit like the, um, uh, the the prep school kids who who proclaim to listen to rap music, right? That that means that <laughs> their exclusionary behavior is, is totally justified. Well, obviously, it's it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, but but Malcolm X did. did was intelligent enough to notice this at a very early stage. And, and let's not forget Malcolm X's proclamation. And this holds even today, a lot of people kind of, kind of forget this. He, 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 he criticized white liberals and, and felt that white liberals were probably even more dangerous to the, to the black movement than white racists. And, and that's something that, that, that's, that, that, that's kind of forgotten in a lot of the uh, the, the racial dialogue of today. So yes, hypocrisy there was, was was rife, and there's more than enough to go around. And it's understandably irritating to 
the people being policed, namely the, the blacks, being punished for participating in, 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 in an economy that was serving whites and that was uh, created by whites, arguably, you know, uh, the Johns and the booze drinkers and so forth. So that was certainly infuriating, as you mentioned. You, uh, this is from, <clears throat> excuse, Chapter 4, East Texas Storm Clouds, as we're getting to all of the, the mutiny and such. Uh, and you write, this is just down the road in Waco, which we have been talking about before, uh, more recent events in Waco. But the lynching of Jesse Washington, uh, and you give some of the graphic details, which I think is important as well. Uh, you write, all the while, Mr. Washington was being beaten with sticks by an angry white mob. The thrashing was perhaps an act of mercy as he might have lost consciousness. Soon, men with sharp instruments appeared. Others grabbed both his legs and forced them apart. As he writhed in terror, the mob castrated him. Contrary to stories about farm livestock, this was not a matter of a few quick snips. Washington's genitals were grabbed pulled and slashed for several excruciating minutes his ravaged flesh was torn away as he struggled and shrieked nevertheless the pinnacle of washington's torment lay ahead footnote two i'm skipping to the next page that chain handler well, i'll even back up a little bit to increase his suffering washington was doused with oil and the kindling was lit Washington was repeatedly raised and lowered into the flames by somebody who ensured that he was always conscious and who presumably was familiar with how flesh reacted to heat. That chain handler likely would savor grilled meats with his family the following weekend without a shred of guilt. After Washington repeatedly climbed the piping hot chain, the crowd cut off his fingers and broke his arms. Shouts of delight were heard as Washington burned. Children from nearby schools watched some climbing trees for a better view. Many parents considered participation in a lynching as a rite of passage for young men. Photos were taken of the dangling charred stump of what once was once a living, breathing human. Even his mangled form showed his natural muscularity, masculinity that white men subconsciously feared. Many in the crowd were smiling as the photo was taken. The torture not only broke Washington's body, but rendered him unrecognizable. Amid a Sunday picnic atmosphere, the spectacle drew a large crowd of up to 15,000 at its peak. This is with no social media to coordinate including the mayor and the police chief. Nobody intervened. We'll stop there for Jesse Washington in Waco, just down the road in Houston. I think this is such an important aspect of context, and I would be remiss if I did not say again, number one book all time, Delectable Negro, Human Consumption, and Homoeroticism, in U.S. slave culture, right there would be a brilliant, terrifying illustration of it all. How is all of this relevant, other than being pretty close in terms of years to when the Camp Logan mutiny takes place, but why was this relevant for context? You, you nailed it on the head, and I think you read it exactly as, as I intended. I added those elements, which are often forgotten um, by, by, by kind of the, the, the mainstream historical views and, and presentations. They, they, they tend to gloss over some of the more, shall we say, the more base motivations. And, and it, it, to give more context to that, I mean, a lot of these riots, I mean, take, for instance, the, the, the uh, St. East St. Louis riot, they were triggered by reports that black men were corralling with white women. So, so look, you know, all, all the political, economic, uh, housing arguments, those go out the window. When you, 
when you have uh, what are considered an alien race of people to, to, to the whites, when you have them infringing upon the, uh, the amorous pursuits, the, the, the chattel, you might say, of the white man, uh, that being white, uh, white women, you will have, you will have all hell break, breaking loose. So I, I, I think when the historians try, try to paint a lot of these events in broader historical, cultural perspectives, they're leaving a lot, you're leaving a lot, a lot of the, the more baser and cruder and obviously unflattering motivations that, that, that are, uh, that, that make people do horrible things. And I, yeah, I, I admit that some of the erotic elements and, and uh, that, that, that I included in the book, especially with, uh, with Easter Washington, um, were, were motivated in part by the actual, the book, Confessions of Matt Turner by uh, William Styron, um, and also the uh, the film Goodbye Uncle Tom. I, I <laughs> I'm curious, have you seen that? I, I'm guessing you probably know it better than I do. I have seen the film uh, Goodbye Uncle Tom. Uh, it has been whew, it's been some years, but I had to. Oh man, if my memory serves, it's been a while since we've discussed that film. But if memory serves. I think they actually went to Haiti to get the black people to do the filming. Don't hold me. I couldn't put money. I may put a dollar. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Give me my dollar. Give me my dollar. <laughs> I mean, this film is completely over the top with that sort of a thing. Um, you know, the, 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 the notion of the, uh, you know, the, the, the sexploitation of, of black women and these, uh, these perverted white masks they, they certainly painted that picture and there, there's, there's there's good reason why this film was <laughs> extremely controversial and again it's also not really talked about because if you, you couldn't make something like that today i don't i don't even think uh, quentin tarantino would touch that uh, with a 10-foot pole but but those elements are there there's no question about it i mean you can see a a, a more direct line with the uh, the lynching of emmett till this was based purely upon the, the, the sexual, uh, uh, <clears throat> the sexual, uh, <laughs> the, the, the insecurities, the word is facing, the sexual insecurities of, of the white population. They were enraged at the idea that, he, that this, this black man would have the audacity to, uh, to whistle at a white woman. And you couple that with also the the behavior of the uh, of the white women at that time, compared to the behavior of white liberal women today, and we, we, I, I include some examples there as well. And you kind of see this entitled uh, holier than thou idea of, of, of the white woman's flesh is, is forbidden territory, and that anybody who dares and fringe upon this should be essentially lynched, tortured, and, and, and killed in a very grisly way. And to bring it back to, to, to the passage you, you just read, the, uh, the results of, of this kind of thinking were, were very, could, could often be very, very grisly. Um, when, you, when you think of the, uh, the mangled face of Emmett Till, that, that's, that becomes very apparent. And of course, as you described, the lynching of, of, of Jesse Washington was uh, absolutely barbaric, brutal. It, 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 it's not like you see in movies where you know the blacks are roughed up, punched, and you know hung in, in, in very quick fashion. Uh, no, no, the lynchings could often be very, very barbarous things that you would not expect could ever happen in, in, in the United States. At that time, um, and, you know, there's something akin to uh, to uh, the uh, uh, the political leader Caligula in, in the most depraved uh, eras of Roman history. Mm. So I, I so yeah, I, I certainly did not. I was not shy about writing and including uh, some of some of these these more darker and sinister elements that that. Um, 
unfortunately, uh, are very common in, in, in human beings, in society. And uh, I'm not sure if I include it in the book, but Dostoevsky says that that evil, it, 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 runs, through, it runs through the heart of each man. Mm. You, uh, at the beginning of your response, you said that often uh, mainstream elements, uh, they will not discuss or will be euphemistic uh, in the telling. That's one that I'm always very explicit about. Uh, that's white people. And even James Lowen talks about this being an obstacle to him doing his work for the book Sundown Towns, where a lot of this information is going out and terrorizing black people and sometimes ejecting, purging the entire group from the town uh, and saying that white people would go and raid the newspaper office in the town or what have you and deliberately destroy all of the archives of when one of these events would happen. So if you go to look 10, 20, 50 years later and be like, dang, where did all the newspaper, Tulsa or something like that, where did all the newspapers from when this took place and they're all gone? Like that sort of thing is regular, uh, regular elements of how white people lie and deliberately omit these facts because this Jesse Washington, this is another event that was well covered uh, to just say that he was killed or to downplay all of this grisly. And this is a pe- number one book, The Delectable Negro. This is white culture. Even take this all the way up. We just talked about this year in Mississippi, the other Magnolia area. The Goon Squad in Jackson, where they were getting black males and covering them with chocolate sauce and breaking out dildos. Did you see that in Mississippi, Jackson? That was just this summer, Mr. Salazar. Did you see that? Oh, goodness, no. (laughs) Big deal. They got convictions. These white officers who had a history of white supremacy racism in the state of Mississippi, but getting they made these black males shower together. They covered them with chocolate sauce, put a gun in one of the black male's mouth and shot him in the mouth after covering them with chocolate sauce and sexually assaulting them with dildo. This is in a court transcript. And they did the same thing. All of that extra details, the grizzly, the dildo and chocolate sauce, they omitted that. So when you go read the news report, it'll just say, oh, goon squad assaulted black males. And it's like, wait a minute. What did they do exactly? You have to go get the court transcript. Chocolate sauce? Dildo? What? What? Oh, my God. 2023, Mr. Salazar, not way back, not Turner days and Jesse Watt. No, man, this year, Joe Biden's presidency, this year, Mississippi. Oh, goodness. White culture and the omission. It's willful. It's deliberate. It's because you would really have to step back. Delectable Negro, what is going on? Chocolate sauce? Why are white people putting black people's testicles in a jar to save and to brag about? rhetorical to think on Uh, you and that's even one that I point out is there a record like if you're talking about you know Hispanics and such is there a record of this sort of behavior them uh, keeping so called Hispanics Mexicans genitals in a jar for decades bragging about is there a record of that sort of conduct oh goodness (laughs) thankfully not that I'm aware of okay just point that's one that i point out too when we talk about who is subject to the worst mistreatment because they they can't even count the number of times that this sort of thing with black people even on john burge in chicago putting the electric cow prod on the testicles of black people they got to put this in the chicago textbooks in the chicago public schools now white terrorism putting literally what i just said putting cow prods electric uh, prods on the testicles of a you did it say you did it yeah yeah that sort of thing white culture what is going on delectable negro uh you specifically and in this environment with jesse washington and you're leering at these white women you talk about just the general charge of uppityness and i love that word i try to be an uppity negro myself where you've got these black soldiers Hey, man, you are not going to tell me where to go and which fountain to drink out of and boss me around and tell me I can't get on the streetcar. You even include the details. They would snatch down 
the sign and say white fountain colored. They would snatch down the colored fountain and wear it like, oh, my God. We are that's, the uppity Negroes, I guess, contribution. Put that in quotes. The uppity Negroes contribution to why this conflagration takes place in 1917, Mr. Salazar? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty accurate. A lot of the animosity was created by the outrageous idea that black servicemen could exhibit some form of self-respect or that they could they could be proud of their status as servicemen and this enraged much of the white population and dovetailing a little bit about upon the, about the, the book you know to the uh, to, Delectable Negro. I would argue, and I, and I hinted a little bit about this, uh, with the idea that the the racist policeman who who beat up the uh, the Buffalo soldiers uh, it probably had some kind of a personal inferior inferiority complex, or they were enraged at the idea that you had these black men, these proud young men, peak shape of their life. They were carrying military-grade assault rifles, and then you had these kind of pathetic white bullies who didn't like seeing this, and that arguably triggered them to to, to play the whole who has a bigger phallus game, you know, I'm saying that in a, in a polite way, and then that caused all hell to break loose, you know. It kind of gets back to the idea of, you know, our, our sexual urges often are the, the root cause of uh, many of, of history's worst historical calamities, right? I mean, uh, Cleopatra, her beauty uh, led to the, the downfall of, of empires. <laughs> um, silly things that, that, we, that we do for very base reptilian brain reasons. Um, uh, so, yeah, that, that, that dovetails with, with what you were saying. I found that passage. I'd actually highlighted it anyway. Uh, where you write, Officer yeah, Sparks yeah. represented a type of antebellum policeman who saw himself as a self-proclaimed guardian of a vanishing southern way of life, in quotes, which perhaps never even existed. White peasants who labored next to slaves somehow felt that the grand plantations represented their heritage raised in neighboring and racially charged Fort Bend County, a center for plantation slavery. Sparks had a history of brawling with blacks. As an officer, he made it a point always to let black suspects know that whites were squarely in charge. As an aging municipal policeman, he was likely unhappy with his lot in life, enraged that younger, fitter, more virile black men in uniforms with medals were issued Springfield rifles and sent to fight on his behalf. He was suspended previously for 10 days by Chief Brock for verbally assaulting a woman as he arrested her son. E, black male privilege. Uh, with all of this to me is the same when you're talking about this sexual anxiety that white people have about black males specifically and this motivating what I'm seeing is a lot of black misandry, Jesse Washington. Black males having guns seems like a specific component of the Virili- uh, the virile black man, even the gun as a phallic symbol, like what is going on? I'm a white man. I'm supposed to have a gun, not these niggers. And you even include that in the book, a long history, even ongoing Philando Castile of white people saying, wait a minute, guns are not for niggers. You're not supposed to have gun- the Klan making this a part of their objective. Uh, the Black Panther Party, you include that. And I think that's a part of that sexual anxiety, like men are supposed to have guns. Black males are not even supposed to be men, much less have a gun. That's how we end up with these mutinies. Am I am I misspeaking? <laughs> yeah, again, you, you you nailed it. You nailed it on the on the head. Um, you know, in terms of the lynchings, I mean, what did they do with the genitals of these these lynched black men? You know, of course, they they removed them. That was their their Neanderthal response to to a perceived threat 
So obviously, in in modern times, you you could say, well, we're we're taking away their guns. Well, they, are you really, or or is that just a, just a, a more benign or seemingly benign way of of emasculating uh, the black the black population? That that's that's a, a an aspect of this this question that is rarely considered. And I, I think movements, pro-black gun movements, I think they do understand this a lot better than the, the pointy-headed uh, liberals and academics who, who, who think that they know better what blacks want and need than black folks themselves. And I think that conversation or that, that pivot needs to, needs to occur. Are you familiar with the book uh, by Charles E. Cobb, That Nonviolence Stuff Will Get You Killed, How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible? <laughs> I'm not familiar with the book. I'm familiar with the sentiment. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because within the black community, Lear voices, um, you had a lot of this tension, right? You had the Martin Luther King approach. And then you have the Malcolm X approach, and they didn't always sort of see eye to eye. Um, and that's a valid question, you know. What's 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 the right way to do this? Not, mm. I'm not quite sure. Mr. Cobb, he was in SNCC, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and that book it was published 2014. And that's when I alluded before. I said I had heard about Camp Logan before. He includes uh, the Camp Logan mutiny in this book and the whole, as I said, he was in SNCC. And so he was down in Mississippi, 1960s, James Meredith, all of that bloodshed, 1964, uh, the summer of uh, Cheney and those two missing white boys, all of that. And he talks about, he says one of the main points of his book was that he thinks that the reflexive thought is when people think of black people and armed self-defense, they think of the Black Panther Party or they, the image that you mentioned in the book, Malcolm X with the bandolier in the window in the north. They do not think of black farmers, black people in the rural south with overalls, deacons of defense, uh, Robert F. Williams, uh, uh, the Camp Logan mutiny, they do not think of black people in the South, where you have hunters anyway, and a strong gun culture anyway, these also being black people who resorted to counterviolence and should try to defend themselves as best they could against racism. And he mentions uh, the Camp Logan mutiny in building up to, and even Nat Turner, in building up to what happened in the 1960s, where we're saying nonviolence, but this is only working because we have armed black people around us who are there to make sure we don't get killed. And even Dr. King uh, was a gun owner and believed in self-defense, but he mentioned so many Southern black people. And I said, oh, that would have been such a great addition to your book, because Texas is right there in the South. And even Rosa Parks, he talks about her Rosa Parks family. She's often thought of as like this beacon of nonviolence that her family was all about firearms and black self-defense. Uh, that's I just thought that was such a big plug uh, for Charles E. Cobb's book. Uh, and Southern black people, which is a big theme of this book, uh, black self-defense, but so many black people kind of, even the, the anecdote that you included in Florida where the same thing happened with the soldiers in response to seeing this child shot at, where that was so common, but it's not talked about, it's not documented. Heck, even more recent, most people don't even really know about the Deacons of Defense, and that's pretty recent history certainly for sure you you mentioned the investigation that martha Gruing, who is a white woman not even a u.s citizen that she did for the naacp in response to all of this and i think this is such a good man <laughs> document for why did all of this happen to begin with? And they get she gets direct testimony from Sarah Travers, who is a white woman. I just want to read this to get your response because I did I found this from just reading your notes, sir. Uh, so this is Gruing writing Sarah Travers, an evidently respectable, hardworking colored woman, not a prostitute. I was in my house ironing. I got five children. I heard shooting, and I'd run out in my yard to see what was happening. Sparks came into my house and said, did you see a nigger jumping over the yard? And I said, no, sir. He came in the house and looked all around, went in the back, 
Then Daniels, the other policeman, he came around the corner on his horse. I called to Mrs. Williams, my friend, that lives across the street, and asked her what was the matter. She said, I don't know. I think they were shooting at crap shooters, black people. He sparks, came in just then and said, you're a goddamn liar. I shot down in the ground. I looked at her, and she looked at me, and he said, you all goddamn nigger bitches. Since these goddamn sons of bitches of nigger soldiers come here, you are trying to take the town. End quotes. He came into the bedroom then and into the kitchen and I asked him what he want. He replied to me, don't you ask an officer what he want in your house. He say, I'm from Fort Bend and we don't allow niggers to talk back to us. We generally whip them down there. Then he hauled off and slapped me. I hollered and the big one, this Daniels, he ran in and then Sparks said to him, I slapped her and what shall we do about it? Daniel say, take and give her 90 days on the pea farm because she's one of these biggity nigger women. Then they took me by the arm and commenced dragging me out. I asked them to let me put some clothes on and Spark says, no, we'll take you just as you are. If you was naked, we'd take you. Then I took the baby in my arms and asked him to let me take it. He took it out of my arms and threw it down on the sidewalk. I'll stop there. They go into more of the details. They beat up uh, these two black uh, soldiers, uh, Baltimore, Edwards, and things kind of unfurl from there. But this is kind of the, the, the crap game that gets interrupted. And then this with Sarah Travers. This is kind of the genesis for everything that unfurls from all of this and you right from her mouth the uppityness you're uppity and these soldiers are uppity and i'm done and and even the man she doesn't have any clothes on and he snatches her out it came to mind what we talked about sneaking to the reservation we talked with dr kenneth o'reilly and he said another part of white culture white sheriffs taking advantage of black females just like plantation days this continued right up hey even today roger galuski but that came to mind for me immediately uh this isn't your writing but you quote from this report just the significance of this i don't know <laughs> arrest beating of miss travers yes um, I'm, I, I didn't quite hear your question with the section that I just read from the Gruing report, uh, can you tell the significance of how this incident, these black soldiers specifically, seeing this black female being dragged out, half naked, child thrown down, them intervening and being beaten, that that was kind of the catalyst uh, for all of this? Just your your thoughts? Oh, right, right, yeah. Uh, certainly, that that was unacceptable. I mean, these were these were men that were that, that swore to to protect the their community, their, their country, and seeing women who had done nothing uh, being handled so disrespectfully uh, sparked, sparked their, uh, their protective instinct. Um, there's, there's no question about that. And one interesting detail that, that you didn't quite mention was the fact that the, the woman, Susan Travers, was painted she was sort of smeared as a, a woman of ill repute right so so you you had this you had the the black men being uh, sort of emasculated uh, as a revenge and then on the same on the flip side you had the women being smeared as uh, as prostitutes for loose women <laughs> it all kind of it all kind of comes back to the same sort of motivations which is rather creepy um so I, I i i certainly agree with with the uh, passage uh, that you read and uh, i think that sheds a light on the uh, reflexive instincts of of these men and why that that was such a powerful uh, moment for them you kind of go on to give Lots of the details about how all of this kind of unfurls and the the hysteria. I noted again, we've read so many of these reports about different lynchings and white mob events. And 
liquored up white people pops up regularly. Like, I don't think I can remember one of these where uh, Jesse Washington and his family, like, they're all liquored up and trying to do, like, it's always liquored up white people and guns. Uh, and once white people start finding out that, oh, my gosh, the black people are plotting and they've shot up and, you know, all of this, they giving out loads of guns to white people. You point out they don't give any guns to black people. Uh, and start amassing a posse and calling in for reinforcements. Uh, this is one of the few, I don't know what to call it, so-called race riots, mutinies, where you actually have more white casualties than black. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, that that, that cer- certainly made the, the mutiny unique. And what made the, what, what made, what motivated me uh, while I was while I was writing the book was the whole idea that this is kind of one of the first times where in American history where you could say this is the day that the the blacks fought back with overwhelming power, right? Um, you know the, the the previous rebellions were a kind of desperate attempts to. Uh, under uh, under overwhelming odds, uh, but this time they had rifles. These were trained soldiers. These were men who many of whom had experienced combat. So the the, the tables were turned for once, and I think that they, this this really gave the uh, the story and especially in my book uh, this flavor of uh, kind of a black power. Uh, the the idea that that now we we have the means and the motivation to to finally fight back you know this is our day of of retribution um, so that that was a unique part of this this event probably contributes to why more people don't know about this event now i don't think this is at least at this point i don't think this is like a celebrated aspect of houston or texas history um, you use the what should I call it? biblical uh, reference, Sons of Ham, when referring to uh, the black members of the 24th. Um, why is that a kind of a continued reference uh, phrase that you use to refer to these black soldiers, Sons of Ham? That was I, that was part of the creative aspect of of, of the book, the, the, the more of the uh, the creative writer side of me, and I, I witnessed that initially in some of Melville's work, and the, specifically the the book that 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 inspired that the colloquial usage was uh, his book, The Handsome Soldier. Uh, not sure if you're familiar with that, but that's really kind of. Uh, a, a parallel upon the the life of, of of Jesus and how a young sailor was liked by everybody and he was um, he was eventually convicted and executed because he was a good person because he was too nice and he was too too liked and the authorities simply could not could not put up with that and then they 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 killed him um, interesting work by Melville and he talks about. Uh, the, the the blacks at that time, and he refers to them kind of as the sons of Ham. Uh, that's as far as I went in terms of that. I know that a few uh, a few reviewers have, have brought up that this has some some darker connotations, but I, I <laughs> that certainly was, was not the direction I was I was going for. That's interesting. I I know of Herman Melville only for Moby Dick being forced on us for so many uh, generations, uh, but I've not read his other. It's the Happy Soldier, I think, unless I misheard. Um, I've not read that one. Handsome, handsome Soldier. Handsome, sorry. Have not read handsome that one. Um, the Sons of the. Yeah, that's. I would probably be in agreement with the folks who reviewed it because it's not in quotes. Like, that would be different if somebody referred to them and you're quoting or what have you, but. Yet like that, that is what black people have been called as a justification for slavery, um, that they are the sons of Ham and are cursed like that. That's to me, it's religion of white supremacy, racism. Like that's literally that's I mean, that's not my interpretation. That is 
documented history of how that phrasing has been used to justify mistreating and abusing black people all over the world. So I don't know why that would. Yeah, I mean, it's not like an endearing title, right? Right, right. Well, it's interesting that, that you mentioned that because there, there was a brief mention of the Buffalo Soldiers in Salt Lake City. And, of course, this is a, a, a Mormon uh, hub, uh, you might say, uh, one of the, one of the, one of the, the main settlements of, of the Mormons. And, as, as, as some people know, the, the Mormon faith has, has had that, that, that regressive in the past. I'm not saying today. They've, they've, they've changed. But in the past, they had the view that, as you mentioned, that, that blacks were in some way imbued with with original sin and that's why god gave them the dark skin and it was allowed to, to it was it was justified uh, to be enslaved uh, they they don't have those views anymore but yeah there there there, there has been religion used and skewed in ways uh, to to justify uh, the enslavement of blacks um that's not to say that, that that there were also abolitionists who were devout Christians who who advocated for the uh, emancipation of, of, of slaves, and of course you have the uh, the vast majority of blacks today in America are are, are professed Christians as well. Um, but certainly, I, I, I accept your uh, I accept your your you pointing that out. There, there's no question about that. Even the passage that you mentioned where you bring up Utah and their racist uh, views, I think that's accurate, historically accurate, evidence-based, um, that Mormon theology at that time, I would argue, even still today, I've heard black Mormons who said, hey, they don't exactly do an adequate job of addressing all of this. And even looking at the people who are in charge, have they really changed? But well, that's another book. Uh, the Mormon theology at that time held tenuous beliefs about black people. I'd say even that racist beliefs about blacks believing that they were cursed and thus given dark skin modern interpretations suggested that Canaan was punished through Ham his father and that Ham had sex with white with the wife of his father Noah and even that you know additional component we're back to the same thing that we've been talking about that there's there's an implied sexual deviance about black people it's not just that they have dark skin it's also ooh, ooh, there's just sexual oh my gosh just, which they said about the buffalo so and this is not just you know tad said this on the street or somebody put this in the book this is the gospel god said this so, i mean if god said that they are you know ooh, the scent like that's just like oh my gosh like that that is not an endearing title that's not our name no i'm not sons of ham uh, the term militant, what do you mean when you use the term militant, Mr. Salazar? Uh, now, which, in, in which sentence? I, I, just to make sure. Which, I could pick in, in, uh, a bunch of them, in, but just in general. I'll give a sentence, but just oh, again, in general, the term militant, what do you mean when you use that term? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's probably a, a more subdued or more... Uh, trying to be neutral term uh, for, for, you might say, people with, with revolutionary views or, or violent views. I, the, the, there's no question that, uh, for example, uh, Malcolm X might be considered a militant uh, black leader. But certainly a lot of his views were martial in nature and his views on how, how, to, how to advance the cause of blacks uh, did include violent acts um so so that's how i would use the, the term militant thing. okay uh it's a violent act now that's hmm that's interesting uh okay i'll give you because you used the term twice in the book uh the first time that it pops up uh, this is in the chapter East Texas Storm Clouds. Uh, you write, avid readers of W.E.B. Du Bois' Crisis, the publication of the National Association for the Advancement of Color People and the Chicago Defender, a militant black anti-Southern newspaper. Uh, 
Uh, we used to revolutionary ideas and such. Even that term revolutionary is kind of vague. I'm not sure what that means either. Um, my observation has been when people use, in fact, even before I say it, I'm going to give you the dictionary definition for militant. The dictionary definition, we're talking to a lawyer here too, combative and aggressive in support of a political or social cause and typically favoring extreme violent or confrontational methods. Now, when I read that, man, no one in the universe is more militant than racist man, racist woman, racist ch- Jesse Washington, man. Isn't that militant? What happened to him in Waco? <laughs> I, I think I think the word militant has been demonized because because I, to me it, it it is value neutral. It's neither good nor bad, and I think the definition you read is is pretty uh, pretty close to to what I would uh, what I would agree it is militant. It, it, it's been demonized and it's been cast in a in, in a light. I mean every. Every news report of any particular disfavored group always paints them as, as, as militant. Um, I mean, the Prophet Muhammad was militant. He was a martial leader. I, I don't follow that faith, but, but most people would, 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 would agree that that's, that was a, a, a good description of, of uh, a spiritual leader of, of, the, of doing people, and that's not a bad thing. So I, I, I think wording is a tricky thing, and it, it, it can be twisted um, in different ways that it was never sort of intended to be. For sure. In a lawyerly way, I didn't get my question answered. So what the white oh, people okay. did to Jesse Washington, was that militant? I, 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 that, that militant would be a light description. I mean, it was way excessive of militant. I mean, it was barbaric, cruel, unjust. Milton, certainly, I mean, Milton would be buried in, in many descriptions that, that are certainly not, uh, not uh, complimentary. That is even in the actually extreme, favoring extreme violent or confrontational methods. Since the extreme is in there, Yes, that would be easily captured, I think, within the definition. I would use terrorism, but I'm just pointing it out for listeners because with the vi- an extreme violence included in the definition for militant, the word militant is only used in this book two times, and it's for black people both times. That's the pattern in the system of white supremacy. I only hear black people generally non-white people in general but usually it is black people exclusively who are tagged as militant they don't have to be violent they don't have to be extreme sometimes they're just talking about racism myself included sometimes just asking questions about racism and individuals classified as white in fact we had an author on this summer who was classified as white she wrote a book about racism and she did the same thing use the term militant exclusively to describe black people and the one of the people that she described as militant was a black male privileged and he was in between two armed white people he did not have a gun and i said really the black male here is militant not the white people with the gun and she snickered she yeah yeah that would yeah yeah White people, no one is more militant. No one is more militant than white people. And I would push back every time. No black person, I wouldn't care what they're doing. No black person should ever be classified as militant. I've seen that used specifically to devalue, nullify a black person's legitimate views on white supremacy, race, and we got new, someone publishing a newspaper. You see the skew? Malcolm X newspaper is not even a black person with a gun. Am I making sense, Mr. Okay. Salazar? Certainly. Okay. Uh, you, I wanted to make sure I pointed out because Emmett Till got mentioned a few times, and this is in conjunction with what happened with the whole Camp Logan thing. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, this is on, well, I can't give out the page because I have the e copy, so it might not correspond with the physical pages of the books. But uh, this is in the yeah. chapter after the flood, where you write specifically, this is at the very end of the chapter, so you don't even need the page number. Go to the very end, the last paragraph before the footnotes, uh, and it reads. Though, oh, get my F word in too. I'll back. A grand jury refused to indict any of them because no witnesses were willing to testify. A white woman's social status was a reflection of the man she attracted. As such, a black man approaching or making eye contact with a woman, with a white woman, was considered an insult for which a polite no thank you would not suffice. Though the fairer sex abstained from violence, many women were proficient at committing it by proxy via a, via a chivalrous man. On her death in 2008 did Emmett Till's female accuser retract her story which had resulted in his lynching I'm pausing right there are you talking about Carolyn Bryant Dunham right there correct okay are you aware she uh, did not die until this year I not sh- now okay let me, let me back up just a the woman the, woman, the, the Emmett Till accuser that, that's who I was referring to and I'm not sure if I got the dates wrong, but I believe that at the time that I wrote that, she, she was passed away. Emmett Till, unless I have been misinformed, Emmett Till's accuser is Carolyn Bryant Donham. Uh, she did not pass away until 2023. Uh, and even in the text, it says only on her deathbed in 2008. She was definitely not on her deathbed uh, in 2008. And even the retract part, because there's no footnote for this. Uh, what, what evidence have you seen that she retracted a portion of her testimony or what she reported to authorities? Different sources that I read did talk about that. Now, I, it, it, you, ha, you do have a point because there are contradicting sources that say that she, in fact, did not retract uh, her, her testimony. It's, it's a little bit unclear whether... Whose side she was on, especially in the latter years of her life. Uh, different accounts paint, paint her in a favorable light that, in fact, you know, she, she wasn't uh, in favor of what happened to her till, that she tried to prevent it from happening, that this, this was all the uh, machinations of the, uh, the, the men who were outraged on her behalf. And then there were certainly accounts that said that, no, this wasn't. As I mentioned, the book was, was basically using the men as a proxy to, to exact physical violence in situations where a woman was incapable of doing so. Uh, so, so in the very least, I would say that there's, there's a bit of a... Uh, not everyone agrees on, on the exact um, uh, conclusions of, of, of her, her, uh, her experience in that, in, that, in that situation. I know Timothy Tyson published a book within the last 10 years or so. He's a white scholar in North Carolina, and he published uh, basically concluding that she lied, but I've not seen any evidence, report, and like I said, this is not footnoted here, but the bigger point, Carolyn Bryant Donham died this year. Uh, this I'm just looking at CNN, but I mean, you can pick a number of reports that you think are reputable. A woman whose accusations led to the lynching of Emmett Till has died at 88. This is from April 28th of this year so that one is a major uh error uh and it's not footnoted either so that would be one i would you know correct when you do the uh edited version uh particularly because that's such an important aspect of u.s history the march on washington specifically is on august 28th because emmett till was killed on august 28 1955 Uh, and the retraction i don't think carolyn bryan dunham recanted retracted anything uh, and since it's not footnoted i would you know strongly encourage you know go back and see if that's true because i don't think it is uh the other one uh you wrote this is two pages before that same chapter after the flood uh the after weeks past houston went through stages of grief from denial that were pre-existing problems that prompted the troubles anger toward the buffalo soldiers bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance, but only to a point the black group in the crosshairs was the local citizens, although both they and the whites had seen and experienced the same riots. Their reactions differed significantly. It was only 
until the death of George Floyd at the hands of the police that all races finally agreed that the government had committed a grievous wrong and that restorative justice should be sought. That one doesn't have a footnote either. Uh, what evidence did you see that all races agreed that the government had committed a grievous wrong in the George Floyd case? Right. That, that's a good question. I'll, I'll back up just, just a slight bit uh, when you talk about the Emmett, Emmett Till situation. The, the motivation for adding that, that part about uh, the, the accuser was the juxtaposition of white feminism and the black man. Now, if you are online with the, uh, the seeming bonhomi between all the different voices on the left, you would think that, that feminism and, and black advocacy are, are, are completely seamless. That, that's just not the case. And the sad thing is, uh, as we saw with the O.J. Simpson trial, for example, is that if it is privileged white feminism against a black man, I think we know which, which side usually gets the, gets the favorable treatment. Uh, so that was just a, a little nugget that I wanted to throw in there, because, again, this isn't, it isn't always discussed, but it exists. Um, in terms of the George Floyd uh, material that, that you mentioned, my motivation for including that was the sense that in the Houston riots, for example, after the smoke had cleared, uh, the white folks were largely sentimental with uh, with with, with the, the government forces, with the with the police. They sided largely with them um, for doing the right thing, in, in their view, and that had largely been the sentiment of, of, of white America. It was really, and, and I, I won't say that this ha- that this existed in every in every situation, but the qualitative difference between how white America reacted um, after the George Floyd is that you had a large proportion of the white population that sided or at least showed sympathy towards uh, the black. Uh, the black man who was who was killed, and not the white police officer who was responsible for his death. So this was a large shift, an even larger shift that you saw was the fact that you had, for example, in Houston, you had the the police chief of uh, of Houston marching with the BLM protesters, and <laughs> I mean to think that this would have happened 100 years ago would be laughable. But that's how much the tide, the tide had turned. So the sentiment was certainly different, and I think that was one of the major differences between between these these incidents today, and uh, and that, that during the, the the Houston riots. We, I want to make sure we get our caller who dialed in with a question before they depart. Um, my response would be. I'm just skipping. It's on the same page. I'm just skipping down two paragraphs. You write uh, during the American racial unrest of 2020 police forces of several major cities were defunded or wholly disbanded. Um, Which police department do you know of that was disbanded or defunded as a result of George Floyd? That, that's a fair criticism. And I would agree with you that in the, literally that's not what happened. I think as far as they went, is they they they, t- they talked about disbanding police departments. So it, it, in in a factual sense, yeah, that that that, that should be that sh- should have been worded differently. Where this is a history book. I mean, everything is in a factual sense. I would hope this is not historical fiction. And that I was really aggrieved by that because, man, they have New York Times. Like you didn't have to do any hard sleuthing and going through the catacombs. New York Times, enormous report from 2020. Your book wasn't published till 2021. How a pledge to dismantle the Minneapolis police collapsed. And many of the members even said they had no intention of defunding the police. Man, I live in Seattle, Washington. 
we had all of those lame white hooligans running around in the Chaz. I know folks remember that, the, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. And they hung out up here, those lame white people, for weeks. And then everything ended. They did not defund the Seattle Police Department. They are still rolling. They have a morale problem. But they did not disband the police department. They didn't do that in Minneapolis. They have disbanded because towns are shrinking and they don't have enough people to hire police. But that's not the same thing as, oh, man, we did George Floyd wrong. We should like, no, that did not happen at all because there was no large shift in how white people think about racism white supremacy you had many white people they came out making reports that george floyd was on drugs and this was not police brutality Derek chauvin did not kill him he was on drugs just like the rest of his no count negro cousins liquor that's what they said about the folks in logan they were on narcotics and they had all those loose women sneaking in drugs and narcotics and whatever else see we got these old no count coked up see <laughs> same thing same it'd be funny but i'm almost being verbatim to what they said anywho uh our caller who dialed in uh did you have a question jamie salazar author of mutiny of rage uh caller in florida we were talking about tampa before caller uh, retired firefighter did you have a question yes sir yes sir greetings everyone uh uh with all of the terror that uh uh, they've been discussed today and the terror that black males went through shared with black females. Why do you think, I'm talking to the guests, why do you, why do you think, uh, black males, uh, would even join such branches, such units as the, uh, quote unquote United States military? Right. So now are you talking about today or at the time of the riots or, or both? Both. Sure. Uh, because I hear, I hear, I hear problems today. Go, go ahead, sir. Well, right. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I mean, I, I, I think African Americans join for uh, much of the same reasons as, uh, as, as any other group. And, and those include very legitimate reasons. I mean, sometimes they are looking for a skill set. Sometimes they're looking for, uh, uh, for three hots in a cot. There's no qu- question about that. I think the deeper question might be whether it's justified to lay their lives down for uh, for a country that does not uh, respect their rights as human beings. That, that's probably probably the deeper question. And that is that is certainly more more difficult to to uh, uh, to explain. That too, you, know, you, I, you can I, answer I, that if you want. Uh, sure, sure. We'll, we'll we'll look. You know. In my, in my particular situation, I signed up to defend a country that I did not uh, belong to. I, so I, 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 I uh, volunteered in the uh, French military organization, not because I had any affinity for France, but because I, I wanted to, to learn the, the art of soldiering. And I, I think that's, that's probably true for a lot of the soldiers, uh, the, the African-American servicemen um, at that time. And, and today, I, in my book, I talked about some of the very, uh, some of the more interesting and courageous men of, uh, who served in the Buffalo Soldiers and their, their exemplary service in, in overseas uh, positions. So I, I, I think to their credit, uh, some, some people might say to their folly, I think the, the, the black Americans who did serve and, and who served with the distinction uh, would probably differ with the politics of that time. Nevertheless, they 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 thought they thought to uh, to it was a life of honor and of service and um the uh, dissenters be damned okay uh do do you think do you think the return for them uh uh quote unquote serving their country and uh in some cases, dying or or being uh, wounded was was worth the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, consequence. That's hard to gauge. That's hard to gauge. I, I I will say that if you ask most people who served in 
uh, in the military, and especially those who served in combat. And the ones who made it back alive, they would say that they weren't fighting for any particular uh, political cause or fighting for a particular nation state. They were fighting for the guy right next to him. And I think that's the sentiment that you would find with, uh, with the, uh, bl- the black servicemen, um, and, and especially those who, who gave the ultimate sacrifice, obviously, if, if there was a way to gauge their ideas uh, <laughs> uh, from heaven, that might be the response that you would probably get. Last question. And the uh and the 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 battles that are called wars, uh that that was from let's say eighteen sixty to uh the late uh eighteenth century, uh why why didn't uh black males uh once they got their weapons uh form their own military force? Yeah, that's a good question, and I, I I don't quite know why that is the case. But I would I would I would certainly venture to say that the discipline within the you know, the army, navy, or or air force was such that they were motivated to to follow orders, and that that's pretty much par for the course. Um, and I would also argue that 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 whether it was good or bad, not all black servicemen at that time were politically motivated. Some of them uh, were simply men who wanted to, 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 to do something uh, heroic, something honorable uh, for themselves and or their country. And uh, politics was uh, not, not a, uh, a, uh, a component in that equation. Um, I, I, I think on the flip side of that, you could look at the blacks who served for the Confederacy. And of course that is an even more egregious example of something that, uh, that, 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 uh, people today would find difficult to understand. But if you look at it in a historical context, you could say, well, these, these were people that were defending their farm. They were defending uh, their county. They were defending the, uh, the, the, the people around them, their small town. They were defending themselves against the, the northern troops who were burning Atlanta. That's certainly a fair thing to consider and why, uh, why the blacks served in the way they did. Yeah, I, I was just I was just wondering on what was your thoughts because the the starting with the war that is called the Civil War, uh, the the war that uh, the Buffalo Soldiers were known for called the quote unquote Indian Wars. Uh, I think this part of the world with white people was at their quote unquote weakest. And uh, I just figured that would have been a good opportunity for uh, for uh, a uh, disenfranchised, mistreated group of people would uh, go ahead on and uh, basically fight. You know, it, it, it was, to me, I think it was uh, quite a, much of motivation to do so. Uh, but uh, just wanted to know your thoughts on it. Sure, Much sure. I, I think that's a, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good question, and I, I, I think you can look at Haiti and, and and see how that did in fact happen, um, and the situations, uh, whether they were different or not, or or worse. I'm sure they probably were, and how that led to it. So th- that's that's a good a good point to consider. Thank you. Much obliged, retired firefighter. Before we let uh, Mr. Salazar go, I just wanted to get in my my last question. Uh, Like I said, I learned so much from uh, Mutiny of Rage. Uh, If you are a Texas resident, you should know about this event, especially now since they have just got the uh, clemency uh, for 100, (laughs) way late, but still, you should know about this. Anyway, uh, in the chapter Viva La Muerte, uh, Hispanic roots, so-called, he right now, This is, let's see, okay, only after the smoke cleared and the rebels evacuate. In fact, before I even get that, I want to make sure I go back to uh, Carolyn Bryant Donham. Uh, I certainly, as someone who has long emphasized that white women practice racism, that is not a commonly held belief. So many folks uh, submit that it is the man, white male patriarchy and the like, and I've said that that is hogwash. You cannot have a system of white supremacy racism without Carolyn Bryant Bryant Donham and lots 
of white women in tow. I always mention white women supported Trump. The that the majority of white women voters went for Trump both times. All economic, social economic breakdowns. But with Carolyn Bryant Donham, it's not just by proxy because we've done a number of programs. Dr. Tommy J. Curry and a number of other scholars, white and non-white, have pointed out that there has been a deliberate effort also to obscure the role of white women and even the direct participation of white women like Carolyn Bryant Donham in the lynchings of black males uh, and it not just being a rite of passage for white males but a rite of, rite of passage for white people males and females uh, and even with Carolyn Bryant Donham some of these scholars uh, Keith Beauchamp, he did the documentary The Emmett Till Story and worked with the FBI in reopening that case he told us Carolyn Bryant Dunham was present to identify Emmett Till the night that he was lynched. She was right there in the car and that this gets obscured not just with her but with white women in general that it is not a proxy thing through white women. They are willing participants and, and even in the pictures frequently they're right there. Amy Louise Wood talked about this as well that there has been this way, a part of that white innocence is that oh no white women weren't at the picnic. Oh no white women weren't the ones digging in. Let me get a souvenir from Jesse Washington Oh, yes, white women were. And Carolyn Bryan Dunham did not die in 2008. Now, the passage, uh, only after the smoke cleared and the rebels evacuated the area, did the seriousness of their actions dawn upon them. The soldiers marched on the double, yet their swift feet could not spirit them away from the massacre, which trailed them like a malevolent spirit. A grim silence fell upon the entire unit. Few talked, although all understood that they had escalated the rebellion to a new level by killing a high-ranking military officer, one who had come in peace like Oedipus Rex, who gouged out his eyes in anguish after mistakenly having sex with his mother. Many soldiers repented, participating even indirectly in the killings. Men held their breath and blinked, hoping the nightmare would end. Soldiers wished they had never left the safety of Camp Logan's gates. Although military life was hard, the fences and barracks were also motherly arms that kept those men safe. Legio Patria Nostra, the Legion is my homeland, was a popular military maxim. I thought that was such a profound metaphor, really both of them, the Oedipus Rex comparison, uh, and then the military barracks as mother to these black troops. Uh, what was what was the thought process between, behind these two metaphors, Mr. Salazar? Then we'll let you enjoy your evening. <laughs> That's a good question. Um... It, it, it relates a little bit to, to sort of my <laughs> love-hate relationship with, with the Foreign Legion. Uh, I, I, I often tell people that I, I wouldn't trade the experience for a million dollars, and I wouldn't do it again for two million dollars. So it, it, it's a little bit of that love and hate. You know, you are in the mud. You are in the, the thick of it, and you are hating every minute, moment of your life. But you look it back upon it, and you think this is, this is really kind of the essence, essence of the, my, my finest hour. So in that sense, these proud black servicemen uh, were certainly not happy with the way they were treated by by the, the U.S. Army. But at the same time, this was the place that was uh, watching over them and who expected great things from them. And when they made this calamitous mistake of, sh- of mistakenly shooting this uh, this army officer, they realized that they probably uh, did something that, that certainly could not be undone, and they wished that they could turn back the time on that. And of course, I'm sure that many of them were uh, counting the days before they would <laughs> no longer cease to exist, knowing the, the, the military justice at, at that time. So that's what I was trying trying to portray, this very confusing and often conflicting emotions that were surely going through these young men, men's minds and hearts at that time. Okay. And then the, the barracks as a mother to these black troops. Sure. Sure. A, a, a strict parent. To be, <laughs> the military has always been known as a, a very tough, Taskmaster, but it, it, it's not just the military establishment itself. It's 
the brothers in arms, the, the guys that you're next to. It is the stern but highly respected and effective uh, First Sergeant Henry, who obviously was one of the ringleaders, uh, but he was also one of the most beloved and respected men in the unit. And of course, he was one of the men who, who was responsible for some of the, uh, uh, in many ways, for, for instigating the riots. So you did have this conflicting uh, sense of you, 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 you have this motherly organization of your, 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 your brothers in arms and your superiors who are looking after you. And then that is ripped apart by mistakes that were made by the exact same people. Hmm. Fascinating. I'd point that out on neutralizing workplace racism, how often the work environment, they have these family metaphors and such. Like, that is... Um, the I will say with the Oedipus Rex, and that's even more interesting because we talked about the sons of Ham, and I read that portion about Noah. The biblical metaphor is that this is punishment for having sex with the wife of the father, Noah. We are right back with more of some sort of implied sexual deviance where there's a metaphor uh, Oedipus Rex having sex with your mom where it, it consistently there's some and again, that's what they were saying about the black troops, uh, lascivious lecherous just like jesse washington Oof. uppity all that like it's fascinating the number of times that some sort of uh, sexual innuendo will be explicit implied consciously subconsciously it is fascinating um yeah fascinating did am i making sense do you see that the the sexualism in these different metaphors sons of ham and then again with oedipus rex the the sexual some sort of sexual deviance really is right there in the metaphor in the comparison to these black troops. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yes, certainly. And that, that's certainly a motif in the book. And I, I mentioned this briefly. I, I forgot to, to flesh it out. But the 1970s book, The Confessions of Matt Turner by William Styron, was it, it, looking back, it was. It, I mean, I think I think it, it won the Pulitzer Prize. It was, it, it was it was seen as a very substantial work of literature. But you also had the same criticism because it, it, his book it was fictionalized, but it, it, it sort of told the story of what Nat Turner likely would have been thinking, likely likely would have said and done. But it was fiction, and it did introduce a lot of sexual elements into it, and there was a lot of criticism. Uh, uh, Towards 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 the author, and the, the very same sort of criticism, criticism that you bring up uh, were made back in that day on the same book. So, in in a sense, I, I uh, there's a lot of similarities between his approach, the, Mr. Simon's approach, and, and my approach to this, uh, using these sec, these motifs that existed at the time um, uh, as a way of exposing the uh, the undercurrent of of, uh, of of the urges and the motivations of the people at that time. Hmm. I'm just pointing out for folks who don't interrogate metaphors such as myself, in these metaphors, uh, the sons of Ham and uh, Oedipus Rex, if you know your uh, Greek mythology, in both of these instances, the confusion or tragedy or what have you is a result of their sexual waywardness, deviance, if you will, uh, in both instances. That is why these folks are being punished. With the black soldiers at Camp Logan, I don't think they, I don't think their problem was a result of their sexual waywardness, although the white authorities did say that <laughs> they went in the tr they said that in the trial that see you were letting all these loose women in sneaking alcohol and no morals and being loose and lascivious they did say that uh, explicitly but that was not the issue the issue was white supremacy racism I just that is amazing uh, to me how free was it did you pick those metaphors specifically because of the, the sexual deviance in those metaphors and how that's consistently applied to black people or was that just subconscious. Uh, yeah, well, in terms of the, in terms of the Ed, Oedipus Rex, that was that, that was <laughs> that was not an angle that that I was thinking of. But I, I, when you when you brought it up, I, it, it makes uh, perfect sense. But no, that was that was coincidental. Okay. Much obliged uh, again, Veterans Day, man. This great conversation, as he said, like this would have been a great chat 
for Veterans Day, but they have celebrated all month. So, hey, chat it up. If you know some black veterans, this might be a book that they want to uh, check out the next time that, you know, someone, uh, particularly if it is a white person, they put their finger in your face or say, respect our veterans out kneeling on the field. And, and, and Hey, Camp Logan, hush all that up, man. Black veterans experienced a lot, a lot. Jackie Robinson, man, court-martialed, veteran, cut all that out. Uh, much obliged. I learned so much, uh, Mr. Salazar, although that is, in my view, that is two major errors, the defunding the police and Carolyn Bryant Donham, like facts and accuracy is super important. I tell our listeners that all the time. Learned a bunch. Thank you a bunch for hanging out with us. Uh, we will keep an eye out for future work relating to justice, uh, Mr. Salazar. Certainly. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Good day context of white supremacy our guest again uh mr jamie salazar jaime i took years of spanish i could have done that jaime jaime i got my pronunciation that's a very common name uh in so-called uh spanish speaking territories jaime we had a bunch of people had that name in my class jaime jaime ma'am oh jaime did he do anyway uh Be here tomorrow for the book club. Uh, It's Catherine Massey book club with Michael Swango. So looking forward. uh, One of the best book, the best book that we've read this year. Easily the book that I have enjoyed the most. Uh, Man, you couldn't write fiction that wacky. John Grisham got nothing on what we are reading. Same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We'll take a brief break. And then we'll be right back, wrap things up. Uh, context of white supremacy. In fact, I think I'll be able, this was the audio that I was going to start with. Like I said, they just got clemency for these uh, black troops down in Texas. We'll hear quickly uh, update on what just happened a couple of days ago for Veterans Day, even though I do think this is kind of tacky and could be kind of like a, what shall I say, retroactive racial showcasing. New this evening, after more than a century, the Army has granted clemency to 110 black soldiers at Camp Logan, many accused of mutiny in the 1917 Houston riot. Today, the Army recognizing those overturned convictions in a ceremony at the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum right here in Houston in Midtown. Here's Michelle Choi. Yeah, overturning these convictions is a historic move, one that many, including the descendants of the soldiers, say is long overdue, but they're grateful for. Private Leroy Pinkett. Private Edward Porter. It's a painful past that's lasted more than a century. In what's known as the Houston Riot of 1917, 110 black soldiers of the 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry Regiment were stationed at Camp Logan in what is now Memorial Park during World War I a time of extreme racial tension and segregation. After rebelling against discrimination, the soldiers were wrongly convicted of mutiny, murder, and assault. All of them represented by a single officer who wasn't even a lawyer. 19 of the soldiers were executed by hanging. It was the largest mass execution of American soldiers ever carried out by the U.S. Army. And so the Army has undertaken a process to restore their honor. Gabe Camarillo is the Undersecretary of the Army. Having reviewed all these cases, It was clear uh, there was a miscarriage of justice, due process wasn't followed, and now we get to do something to set things right. To right the wrong of the past, the Army has overturned convictions of all 110 soldiers. Their legacies honored Monday at the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum. The Army hereby sets aside all 110 court-martial convictions of 324 soldiers. Their service records will now reflect they served honorably, a reversal their families have been fighting for, including Angela Holder, whose great uncle, Corporal Jesse Moore, was one of the soldiers executed. She's made it a lifelong mission since the age of six to find him justice. This is just a day of relief for my family, and I'm just very honored to be able to see this day. And I didn't think it would come in my lifetime. A sentiment shared by Jason Holt, whose great uncle, Private First Class Thomas C. Hawkins, was also executed. Like Angela, Jason has fought for decades. For us, his legacy is important because we stand on his shoulders. I hope his soul is at peace. 
Again, that was Michelle Choi reporting. The U.S. Army says relatives of the soldiers may be entitled to benefits. Just head on over to KHU.com to learn more information. And also, KHU 11 took a deep dive and looked back at the riots in a special documentary. You can watch 1970 Camp Logan Riot right now on KHU.com. Oh, yep. Yeah. It's that, that documentary is on YouTube. It's on their website, too. But, you know, you can watch it. Uh, reading is more important than watching television. Somebody did say that, I think. Reading is more important than watching television. And I will tell you something. Reading nonfiction, reading, researching, studying racism, white supremacy, that is way more important than watching television. There is a cumulative effect, and I am speaking as someone who is an avid television watcher. Oh, man. Let me get I didn't like scandal and all that, but I mean, you know, it's, it's always something yummy on TV, isn't it? Cooking channel, I mean, you always find something good on TV. Uh, there is no comparison to using your brain computer even when you read a bad book. Now, I will tell you, I don't even think that this is a very good book. Any book where I, Gus T. Renegade, where I am not, nobody says, Gus T. Renegade, you are an amazing scholar. No one says that. So if lame, ignorant Gus T is picking out major errors that your editors, nobody read this book and said, wait a minute, uh, we have put Carolyn Bryant Donham in the grave. She is still alive. Saying that police departments were defunded, like where? Like I said, now, because of what I think white people are not producing huge numbers of children and you have fewer white people who want to tote a gun there is a shortage of police officers that is very different than we're going to defund the police we can't even hire enough white people to hold a nigger knocker and a badge so we got to close the department not the same thing but major errors in a work of non-fiction totally unacceptable that's why you have editors the other component of that I never get excited I never get excited to chastise uh, a non-white person if they've made an error or something is incorrect or if, even if it's just that I don't agree with their perspective I am much more interested in calling out a racist suspect now that alone folks can look do you think Mr. Salazar do you think he would be accepted as a white person you heard him his voice right talk to us two hours basically heard some of the book how he writes how he uses language he did say that at times he is accepted as a white person and I said how do you know classic he said they will go into racist jokes practice racism they assume we've asked so many white people I just stop because they all say the same thing do other racists do they assume that if you are also classified as white that you are racist unanimous yep Now you can evaluate for yourself if you believe a racist says something racist in front of him, do you believe that he tells them, wait a minute, Bob, I am non-white and racism is not cool. Cut that out, man. Susan, hey, I don't know what you think here. I am a non-white person and I do not support white supremacy racism no jokes about non-white people got it Susan you can evaluate for yourself if you think that is true because we talked to a number of non-white people but that is something since there has never been a time when I am accepted as a white person there's never been a time when it's assumed I am a part of the racist team someone says that to me and if I think 
hey, this person could be accepted as white, racist suspect, and that's that. Now, uh, you can hear that beginning of the program. You all can check out Jamie Salazar, S-A-L-A-Z-A-R, and see if you think, you know, based on his photograph, how he presents what you heard, if you think he would be accepted as a white person. And again, white people don't always agree. They have disputes among themselves about who is accepted as a white person. So do you think a substantial number of individuals classified as white would accept him as a white man? Yes, brother, white brother, come practice racism with us. I'm so glad we had that report about racism in Argentina over this past weekend, Spanish speaking country. Uh, he includes some important tidbits uh, about but the errors are, are massive and I can't emphasize enough that is a reason why you want to research and use your brain computer uh, a lot of times they have these sort of errors in documentaries and television programs but as you read even when you read bad books and I would say yeah, this qualifies as a bad book even when you read bad books you will learn you will use your brain computer. The word militant popping up like, oh yeah, I see that pattern. Who are the militants in a system where one group of people, they have Gatling guns and cannons and they can get unlimited supplies of firearms and bullets and bombs. Which group is the militants again? Hmm. That sort of thing, sons of ham, you can pay attention to that sort of thing. Metaphors, there's so much you can learn using your brain computer that is not the same as watching television. You can watch the documentaries, but that's supplementary material. That's really kind of popcorn, unless you got your notepad out and are doing it. Most victims of racism, I've observed this, they do not have a notepad out and scrutinizing, you know, every document, like, come on, please. Uh, let's see. But in this one, they also give some detail about how minimum wage in the U.S. Uh, is also directly connected to white supremacy, racism, and making sure that white laborers can earn a fair, F-A-I-R, wage, so they don't have to compete with no-count niggers who will work for slave wages. Uh, the word F-A-I-R, Fair was used a number of times in the program, even fair skin. Uh, Mr. Fuller does recommend not using that term, supports white supremacy racism. Even the notion of fair skin, especially if we're going to say fair is justice, and then you got fair skin. So the people who are not white, not fair, they're not deserving of justice. Camp Logan, I, just, I guess so. Incidentally, in the segment that we heard, which was just from a couple days ago, they mentioned the term segregation. Totally not accurate. I don't even know what that means, and that's why I included that segment about the so-called reservation. That's not segregation. If white people are sneaking over here to the Negro brothel, which we have heard over and over and over and over. In fact, give it to me, St. Louis you know who's a St. Louis icon? Negro with the bananas, Josephine Baker. Drove the French wild for an legionnaire. Josephine, Josephine. Negro with the bananas, apes. See. But that's not segregation. We want to practice white supremacy racism. And what I said, we want to come hang out in the reservation want to come do some sexual sewering rethinking Rufus males and females males and females that's not segregation they didn't even give these uh, black soldiers an attorney that's the same thing that they do now with Khalif Browder and the rest Sandra Bland get somebody who's never practiced law before or who has 5,000 cases said they're going to restore their honor that's what they said in the segment man <laughs> That's what I say. I'm Gusty Renegade, a.k.a. the undignified negra. Unhonorable. <laughs> like, man, ain't nobody on the plantation got no honor, and it's no way in the world, no way in white Jesus, you're going to tell me 
I've been dead all these decades, nearly a century, because they hanged about two dozen of these black male soldiers. I've been dead for over a century. You're going to tell me we finally will restore your order, your honor, excuse me. You are out of your cerebellum. Like, come on, man. Like, come on. Don't even. <sighs> Undignified, man. No honor, man. Can't be a victim of white supremacy and have some honor. They didn't even go back and what about the pension? Black families and all that interest that they missed out on all those years and benefits that they could have got. Nah. Nah. We'll go put some flowers on it. We'll put we'll put an honorable wreath on their gravesite if we can if we can find that that was even in the book. They couldn't even find the gravesite for these men. We lost it, you know. Negros and you know. What can you do? It took decades. Like they were trying to go to do that. We're gonna put an honorable uh, uh, set of flowers on the gravesite if we ever find it. That took decades. <laughs> we put that over in the Negro file somewhere under the under the dust and such and such. Anyway, they all, he also included an important tidbit about how the white mail carriers. Wait, uh, I guess at that time it would have been male men would deliberately not deliver the draft card for black males so that they would get arrested <laughs> as draft dodgers. I had never heard that before. It was even footnoted. Uh, and in, in the course of the trial, court martials for all of these black soldiers, uh, about 110 of them, uh, they used a substantial number of black snitches to go in and get confessions and all of that. White people have been doing this for such a long time it is so easy fuller and so many others uh, have talked about that that's almost cliche but i mean this is you know over a century ago <laughs> they they send in the snitch i guess they didn't have a wire but whatever the equivalent to a wire they send them in and go talk to leroy and all the rest and then come back and tell us what they said and then okay write that down and go that was a big part of how they broke anyway They've been using Negro snitching, and then they come back and tell us we got a no snitch culture. Please, you have literally, scientifically bred generations of Negro snitches. In fact, double up, Dr. Kenneth O'Reilly two times, he talked about the exact same thing and on an institutional level how they developed snitches uh, where black people lived, barbershop, churches, social functions so they could spy and keep tabs on what Leroy and Lakeisha are up to that again is why reading more important than watching television anywho uh, let's see Retired firefighter in Florida. Do you have a commentary that you? I can't emphasize the errors enough. That is, that's why we have to do research and such because these white people get the lie. Like I said, like now I don't know what it sounds like when other black people talk to him, but man, like, are you out of your mind? I don't know enough about Emmett Till to know Carolyn Bryant Dunham was still alive. That's another reason to pay attention to the news. Like you'd have seen that. Like, oh, that was in the news this year that she just passed away, and that they had been trying to prosecute her criminally charge her for years we talked about that with Keith Beauchamp a decade ago that is egregious as well as the defunding the police that's why you want to pay attention what is happening and that is the danger of allowing white people suspected racists to control information and they become the guardians people that are in charge at minimum research study enough so that you can critically review what these people offer and then really having more of us write study and research because it's not any better to have a black person write a book and have it be full of error we've seen that I've talked about that uh, repeatedly just talked about that on this weekend's broadcast but as I say that all the time I say that all the time strive for accuracy individuals classified as white model this and especially when they come to talk to black people everybody comes to talk to us like we are buffoons and idiots and stupid and don't know anything about anything man study research 
everything because the lies are so numerous. It's an all the time thing. You really have to do so much in terms of just processing, being informed, being aware about things, and even following logic, asking questions to reveal truth, accuracy, and even pointing out errors. Because I think a lot of times, even something as flagrant as that, as Carolyn Bryant Donham, I think many of us, because of white terrorism, we would be timid to call a white person out about that, particularly publicly, uh, and or, man, like they gaslight us because he can give some old lame excuses and all that, even the retraction part of it, like, man, come on, strive for act, you're a white man, or at least you are a su suspected racist, you said sometimes white people accept you as white, that happens often, if that's the case, man, you have access to all kinds of resources, networks, at the minimum, you have other intelligent white people who can put you in touch with a quality editor to get your information correct. Deathbed retraction. That's like egregious deathbed retraction. Deathbed retraction for Carol and Brian Donham. That should be like top sentence for any review of this book. Like, not as great as one of like, man, this book has got egregious errors retired firefighter any commentary that you wanted to add before we wrap up sir yes sir uh is it possible that uh uh those quote unquote mistakes were on purpose uh from the standpoint uh i would imagine a considerable amount of white people would uh buy that book and uh uh from the standpoint of lessening uh the information that it will actually if not the truth is a lie uh it, it it would be in the favor of the white buyer uh I, I was thinking uh as as that was being brought out uh and they're willing to accept a Gus T. Renegade <laughs> that would actually uh, have some experience at doing research and study uh, uh, on the subject. Uh, also, he did a lot of chuckling from you asking questions, which gave me the idea that he was the questions that were asked were making him a little uncomfortable. I put it that way. Now I did see, and I did find a picture of the guest. The first thing comes to my mind, and I'm not an expert, but nevertheless, that's a white male. That's a white male. Uh, I was just thinking, because uh, I think I've heard this explanation before. Uh, a lot of times with a white person is and I would say probably with males to be and I'm gonna use a slang term exotic in their discussions about themselves, maybe talking to a lady or something like that, uh they would they would go into the uh instead of racial classification uh and accuracy they would they would say things like I I'm part and they would mention about from a place on the earth as opposed to a racial classification, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, and, and especially when they're talking to someone that they quickly get an understanding of that does not have a usual understanding of racism, what it is and how it works. They would try to uh, uh, be, you know, be... Uh, Deceptive, that's the word. Be deceptive in their, in their, uh, distinction of who they are, as opposed to knowing, knowing, they, they know that he knows that he's a white person. You know, that, those just my thoughts when I was just listening to, uh, to all of that. And, uh, for a long, last but not least, for a long time, I've always questioned on, on, uh, the questions that I asked, especially, and a, a friend of mine mentioned this yesterday, 
especially during the time of from 1860 to the time when the Buffalo Soldiers were were uh, uh, known as quote unquote Buffalo Soldiers. I'm talking about the 18th century. Uh, that uh, I would say this part of the world was at its weakest as far as military was concerned, and they were given these black male guns. Uh, there were insurrection attempts uh, in the past, so I don't see why not they would have tried it during that time. Uh, you know, uh, and, and they had the training. And they had the training at the time. Uh, maybe negotiate with the uh, indigenous people in the process. But uh, anyway, those are my thoughts. Much obliged, retired firefighter in Florida. I do know at that time period, uh, you still would have had, one, uh, the white training and enforcements in place because of things like Nat Turner and such. You had the Citadel and West Point and other white military institutions and academies uh, to train cadres of armed whites uh, and even just regular white militias and civilians that we hear about today. That was certainly in effect uh, at that time, you had lots of, you would have still had some Confederate war veterans, uh, excuse me, Civil War veterans who would have been alive at this time period, like 1917, early 20th century, as well as World War I uh, veterans. So the military apparatus certainly was not as developed as it is now, but you still would have had, and I mean, you had a lot of, lots of hunting at that point, hunting people and just hunting, period. So you would have had lots of armed why exactly what happened here? Just everyday citizens, the white militia, um, the entire white populace becomes the army at that time, in addition to the National Guard and all the rest of it. So, yeah, certainly not as developed, but I don't think black people you at that time, you had lots of areas where they didn't. It was difficult for black people to even get uh, firearms. And he talks about that in the book, them going around and confisc- uh, confiscating firearms from black people and the Klan, that was a major uh, rallying or talking point, as I shall say, for them at that time uh, to uh, castrate metaphorically black people, black males in particular, to make sure they didn't have access to firearms. So, yeah, it would have been challenging. Um, But that is also an important point about all the snickering, because there was quite a bit at various points. And I think he even said that uh, at least one of the questions I asked, he had not been asked that question before. Uh, and it did seem like he might have been, you know, a little bit more uncom- uncomfortable. I think you and retired firefighter and many others have pointed out that many of these uh, suspected racist guests, it, that might be that they are accustomed to just accolades and kudos from black people, maybe even non-white people, victims of racism in total. And when they don't get that, when there's serious scrutiny of what they're saying uh, and just looking at the evidence, is this true? Is this accurate? What did you say? What do you mean when you say that? Then, oh, wait a minute, militant. Wait a minute, what do you mean when I say militant? <laughs> you use the word repeatedly in the book, so and you're a lawyer. You skillfully use words all the time, so you should be able to tell us what do you mean when you say militant. Even the sons of Ham, that bothered me like greatly uh, because it was never in quotes. Like to just take this tacky phrase that has been like for centuries. They have whole books about this religion of white supremacy this is the justification for why you all are negras why is that our nickname now we didn't call ourselves that why did you put this label on us i don't care what hey, even that herman melville moby dick i'm not surprised he would refer to black people as the sons of him that is not a term of endearment neither is negra every lame label they put on us negras and hoes and all that no 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 a victim of you don't call me any victims of racism how about that? They were called the twenty fifth, uh, excuse me, twenty fourth infantry. How about that? Put any old label on mm-hmm. us, man. Come on, man. Names, words are militant. Same thing. I'm not militant. I'm a victim of white supremacy. The only militants on the planet are classified as white. Taking off somebody's genitals and putting them in a jar. That is militant. Me writing a newspaper on it. Oh, oh, you got these militant niggers out here publishing newspaper. Oh my God. Come on. Come on. All of that is all that sort of thing too. When I read and it sounds like that, that certainly you have dark complexion people with a lot of melanin. We think like racists do too. 
that's a part of how we've been brain trashed. But man, when I read something that sounds like that, like, man, this is what I would expect someone classified as white to say. And you say you're classified as, or you're accepted as white. Often. Hmm. Suspected racist. Mm. There we go. Mm. Anywho, we did our three hours, uh, basically. Be here tomorrow for the book club. Same time. Hope it was constructed. For people connected to Texas, uh, this is not an accurate book. That said, uh, you will learn a lot. It does reference newspaper articles, even about Florida uh, and the state of Texas. You can learn a lot. Just, you know, hey, be critical and make this not the only text resource that you use to inform yourself about what happened. 1917 Camp Logan, Houston, Texas. Uh, sobri- whew, based on what we heard today, man, sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately no nay like sons of ham I've never met anyone who said yes I am a son of ham do not put names titles on people that they do not apply to themselves no throwaway offspring Strive for accuracy. Cow signing up. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, What's brother. Your problem? You're a victim. Uh, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. Uh.